Is it uh, recording now? Yeah, it's recording. So now for a detailed introduction to my end. So I got my electronics engineering uh, degree with the uh, with BC in the same college. Uh, that was in '92. After that, I came to US for my PhD. I uh, went for a PhD in biomedical engineering. So focused on neuroscience. And uh, so I worked with uh, engineering neurophysiology. I used to insert electrodes in the uh, auditory system of uh, small animals and record signals from their brain. And after that, uh, so I got my PhD in 2002. And then after that, I was a postdoc in psychology for three years. Uh, again, working with a uh, rat uh, while they were running around on mazes with electronics, with the electrodes in the hippocampus. Uh, regarding the, you know how they map their their environment in their brain. So uh, 2005, I got I said I had enough education. And I have deviated too much from uh, engineering. So I got into industry and I started off as a retail data scientist with Oracle. So there was a company called Profit Logic in uh, in Boston, and uh, I started working with uh, and that company got acquired by Oracle and became Oracle Retail. I was a data scientist there for three years. That was my first introduction to data science. And uh, so it was my best experience as a data scientist, you know. And that's something, you know, I find very surprising that the, my first first position was my best experience. Basically, it has, they had six data scientists working as a team, and we would be making presentations every day. Uh, you know, one of the data scientists would be making presentations to the rest of them. So you would have at least one day to make presentations every every week, and uh, you know so there would be a lot of interaction, and that's something that I always miss. That you know, getting a chance to interact with a lot of data scientists makes a lot of difference in how you view your work as well as, well as how your work work gets you priority. So that's something you should strive for. You know, the more you can share your work with people, the more you will find yourself succeeding as well as you know making other people succeed. And that's one thing I've not found. After I left data, I found that most data scientists are very uh, conservative about sharing their work. So I would encourage you to you know, share your work as much as possible. Don't consider your work as a, your personal achievement. Let it be, become the achievement of your team and your group. And you know you will find that you learn a lot. As well. So uh, since then, so since then I have worked in the last 14 years. I have worked in 15 different companies. As data scientist. So you can imagine, you know, I've changed my role many times, and there's been multiple reasons for that, and I'm sure we'll talk about all of those reasons as time goes on. But uh, you know, so that's the life of a data scientist. That what what will happen mostly as a data scientist is that you will find that you know the reason you get hired by a company is because the company wants to change its business. So the reason you're being hired is because the company now wants to change the direction of its business. So you are now going to trigger change, and you know what happens when, when everybody knows you are there to trigger change. Everybody is going to hate you like hell. <laughs> 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 because you are there to help them their work. So, but you know there are positives to that also because you know you are the one who is going to make this business grow and uh, you know uh, you know evolve. So that's that's the kind of job you're getting into, a job where. Pretty much everybody would question your existence, <laughs> but you you know in your heart that you are providing value, and that's what you have to focus on. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I like that. <laughs> huh? I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about what is data science. What where does this concept called data science comes from? So this concept comes because we have a lot of data sitting in Excel spreadsheets. In tables, and you've gotten very used to this concept of, you know, tables, where you know there are columns and rows, and you know there's a lot of data. And how many of you have experience with the relational databases? Okay, so that's a decent amount. Or well, you also have it. Okay, how about you? A little bit. I took a couple of months back. Yeah. So you know what a relational database is, right? How about you? You know, just you know, right? And how about you? Hmm? No, not much. Not much. Okay. So the key idea. What's going on? Huh? I have a pop-up. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
glad they got him.
is always other data set. And this is the part which makes data science interesting that you are trying to figure out the context of the data. This is what computers can't do by themselves. You need to have you know, an engineer or a scientist to figure out you know, what the data really means and how the context is related to each other. Because only a human can decide what this really means, what does this data really mean, what, what does the name Joshua mean, or what does the name Elliot mean. Right? All that can only be figured out by a human. For example, uh, you know, there might be one person named E-L-L-I-O-T, another person named E-L-I-O-T. Now, how do you figure out whether these are the same person or, you know, there have been two IDs created, you know, that are of two different people. Address. Huh? Not necessarily. They could have the same address, but that does not still mean <coughs> that they are the same person. Or they could have moved and have two different addresses. Exactly. So, you are thinking about a uh, lot of things here. So, that's where the data science comes into play. That you can hypothesize, you can make all kinds of hypotheses, <laughs> and then you have to test the these hypotheses out. Right? right? You could look at the purchasing pattern of the guy who's named ELLIOD and the person named ELIOD, so they have the same purchasing pattern. Right? So they show up at the, at the store at the same time. So there's so many different things you can look at, and that's the part where data science starts becoming interesting. So why are decisions difficult? <laughs> because what you'll find is, you know, as a data scientist, the value that you provide to a company is in the decisions that you enable the company to make. If you keep analyzing the data the whole day, and then at the end you say, well, I made a really nice chart, and then the, customer, and the boss says, what, is this, how, what does that change in what, what my company is doing? Because they're there, you're there to provide a change. And if you say, well, you know, uh, I really haven't figured out anything that you need to change in a business process, then you'll say, well, you know, as a data scientist, I don't think I need it. So you are in the business of, of make, helping your colleagues make decisions. That's what you have to be aware of. So why is making decisions difficult? Right? That becomes the question. Why do you need a data scientist to come in and help make decisions? So basically, the idea is that basically, you know, you are trying to provide the company with ideas. You are trying to enable the company to chase ideas. You know, and what is an idea? We all associate an idea with the light bulb lighting up. Right? <laughs> Now, how does a light bulb light up? It needs switches, right? So, so you might find that there's one switch that is lighting up this bulb. I was actually planning to show only one switch, but somehow this light is up two switches. So I apologize for that. But let's for a moment assume that there's only one switch, and you don't know whether which side of the switch is on or off. So you have to experiment it out. You have to, you know, uh, turn it on both sides to figure out whether the light uh, really turns on. And this happens to us all the time. When we go to a room. We don't know whether the upside is on or the downside is on, and then we play with it and then we figure it out. Right? Now, what happens in business is a little more complicated than that. Actually, what happens in business is that there are, there are multiple switches, and you need to have all these switches in the right position for the light to go on. Right? So, what does that mean? That means basically for every switch, you have two options. Right? So, if you have 10 switches, how many options do you have? 1024. Huh? 1024. 1024, right? Yeah. Exactly. So, so at least we know that, uh, that, uh, what was your name? John. 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 John's easy. John. <laughs> 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 the other part I like much more though. What was that? Shutoku. Shutoku. Yeah. That's hard. No, but I love that. <laughs> no, thank you. So, so anyway, so, so basic point is this is what happens in business. That you know, for turning on a light switch or, or, or turning on a bulb, you need to have multiple switches in the right position. So the analogy I'm drawing is, suppose you consider a customer. What, does, what makes a customer buy something? That is your light bulb, right? Now, how do you, what, what triggers that light bulb? What makes them come to you and buy something? That might be based on 10 different factors. And it's only when all the 10 different factors are aligned that the customer actually comes and buys something. So as a data scientist, it becomes your job to figure that out as to how these switches need to be placed. Okay, so now suppose this light bulb only goes on when all the 10 switches are in the right position. As a data scientist, you can absolutely do nothing about it. Right? It's only when this light bulb you know, has a tendency to switch on a little bit every time you turn on some switch and you find some pattern in these on and off that you are triggering. That, uh, that you will start using data science. If the bulb switches on only when all the 10 switches are in the right position, then you will not be able to use any data science. Because there is absolutely no information 
coming to you by you know playing with these switches. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Wait. So that means you want to find a function which predicts customer behavior better. Right. That's what you're looking for. Right. Right. So anything. So customer behavior is one thing, right? It could be just like figuring out uh, how many, how many, uh, say how many machines do I need to have on the floor, right? Now that itself is a number. Yeah. So that number is going to getting influenced by the factors. Right? Yeah. So what you what what a manager would try to do is fiddle with those factors to figure out, you know, what is the right. Uh, so he will do a whole bunch of experiments. Even before he hires you, he will have done you know, ten different experiments. Where you would have hired two people, then fired one person, then hired three more people. <laughs> so he might have done like all these things, right? Yeah. And then he says, finally, I have collected all this data, but I don't know how to interpret it. So let me get a data science. Okay. Thank you. And you might come in and you might say, well, you know, you've been collecting all the wrong data. So that, you know, so you might have to start the whole experiment again. But that's the kind of role you are in, trying to understand the data he's already collected and what is the right data he should have collected. Mm -hmm. So now let's go to the next. So very initially itself, I talked about what is your contribution to a business. Your contribution is to bring about a change, right? So we have had uh, data forever. We have had uh, you know databases forever, but now there seems to be a new thrust towards data science. So what is data science doing that was not being done with data before, right? What was happening was mostly data was being used to maintain the business. Right. So usually what would happen is a manager would say, what has happened in the past? I want to understand what has happened. And you know, the the data the the software engineer is is hired would generate some reports, which would be standard reports. Then he might say, Okay, how frequently is something happening? So they would say, Okay, now that we are looking for frequency, I need to you know really dig into this data a little bit and find out you know how frequently something is happening. So that might be the second step. Then he might say, okay, you know, I've noticed there are some exceptions happening. For example, there, there are times when the number of customers coming to my store drops or, you know, where, uh, you know, I ran out of inventory. Let's say these are two possible exceptions. So I want to figure out when these exceptions occur, which was the second part. And the third part becomes figuring out, you know, who gets informed that these exceptions have occurred. Because somebody has to take action on these exceptions. Is that more reactive? Then proactive. Yeah, I mean at that point that's all you can do, right? I mean, right. Right. I mean, unless you hire a data scientist, you can't start thinking about proactiveness. They're just saying, okay, this is my data, uh, but each time I notice something has gone wrong, how do I inform people? Okay. Who are the right people to inform that something has gone wrong? Right? Gotcha. So that's the second part, the third part. So now he goes out and hires a data scientist, and he says, now data scientist, tell me what is happening. So now he says, okay, can you? Can you summarize this data for me? You now, all these things are happening in my store. For example, why do customers suddenly show up on Christmas night and start asking for uh, Christmas tree? Right? We say, well, you know, it is Christmas season. So, you know, so sometimes it's as, as obvious as that, but a lot of times it's not obvious. For example, in data science, you'll hear this thing very often that they, people will talk about how, you know, there's a high correlation between selling diapers and selling beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is the biggest confusion in data science, like as to why diapers sell more with beer. You know? And this problem gets talked about very often. So it's those kind of correlations that you have to find as a dis uh, by doing descriptive analysis of your data. Then comes the diagnostic analysis, where you say, why did it happen? We just talked about that, right? Uh, so that that so now you start looking into something called OLAP views. And uh, probably those words don't make too much sense to you right now, but we'll talk about that later. So the next question would be, then you get into start this. You say, okay, what do I learn from this data? So I'm noticing patterns in my data, but what does that tell me about my business and how? What decisions do I need to make? What possibilities do I have? What choices do I have? To make, okay? I might know that uh, you know these are possible. Like I can increase the size of my store, or I could uh, you know have a promotion. These are all my options available. But even knowing your options requires you to understand the data to uh, to be able to figure out what your options are. Right? So the next question becomes, what will happen next? What if now I start ex exercising these options? So like we just talked about, you know, you have all these switches, and now you're saying, okay, what will happen when I turn on these switches? You know, how will my business get affected? That becomes the pre predictive analytics part. So you say, okay, you know, can I predict by turning these different switches, which which switch will finally turn on turn on this light bulb. Okay. So so then the final thing would be okay, now I know all about the switches, I know what turns on the light bulb. 
out that that uh, sequence from your data and figuring out from the predictive analytics becomes the last part. That way, it comes to predictive analytics. Is this making sense? Okay. So actually, before I start talking any further, I wanted to actually start the conversation with the story, and I'll refer to many stories as we go on. So the reason I was I attribute all my success in my life to my father. And the reason is that he taught me a trick when I was uh, going to high school. Now, I was not doing very well in high school, although I was considered an intelligent, an intelligent student, but somehow I was not doing well. So what my father told me was, don't just open a book and start reading it. First, before you open the book, open a notebook and write about what you think is there in that book. And after you you think you've written everything you think is there in the book, that's when you open the book. Right? So the reason I'm telling you this is this is something I'm going to do to you often. At some point I'm going to say, what do you think I'm going to talk about? <laughs> and then I'm going to talk about it. Right? So then we'll find out what is the difference and then from that we'll learn something. You will learn something, I'll learn something. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I'll so firstly I'll just summarize my data science experience. And then, uh, you know, we'll go into, I mean, I've talked about some of these issues already, but, you know, uh, just have one slide where I can make sure that I covered everything. The first thing is work with 15 companies in 14 years. I already talked about that. Started three revenue generating businesses. Only one was successful. And this is something, you know, you should get into the habit of thinking. You'll find that as a data scientist, you will have to become very entrepreneurial in your life. You should always be thinking about starting another business. You know, or, or wondering about how your boss started that business, you know, whichever business, or whichever, whoever you're talking to, how did they start their business, what were the factors that influenced them to start their business, all that becomes very important for you. Because data science is about figuring out how businesses run and how businesses are successful. So you should really get into the habit of understanding, you know, any business opportunity, you should take it head on and try to, you know, maximize your understanding through that business, right? So that's what I did by starting three different businesses. And of course, you know, like I said, only one of them was successful. So definitely there was there are things I was doing wrong. But, you know, you only learn through experience. So I'm going to talk about the key lessons I learned by, by uh, you know, in the process of, you know, doing data science for 15 years, for 14 years. So the first lesson learned was data science does not does not have anything to do, we not have anything to do with data, but always has something to do with business or technology modeling. So what I mean is that a lot of times what will happen is you will get a hat as a data scientist and you'll be given, you know, say 10 tables. And you look at those 10 tables and you say, there's no data in these tables. So, so what do these guys want me to do, right? <laughs> right? If, if, so if there's no data available, how can I be a data scientist, right? But that's actually not true. Data science is not really about data. It's about modeling business. So really, the, it's a misnomer to call you a data scientist. You are basically a business scientist. Okay, you're in the business of designing new businesses, and you should think of yourself as a business scientist, not as a data scientist. Because data is, you know, data is, you know, by definition, data means garbage. So it's like, you know, to find information and to make use of information is your job. Right? And sometimes information is generated just by talking to people. Right? So that's the kind of habit you should get into. You should try to learn by talking to people much more than looking at your data. Because there's so much knowledge you'll find in whichever organization you go, you'll find that people know so much then than you will ever come to know by looking at data. That you have to capitalize on the information that these people are giving you while you're looking at the data. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Second lesson learned, beware of roles which are not customer facing. So like DP talked about, you know, when he, you might have noticed when he said, you know, as a data scientist, you will be facing customers. But when, as a data engineer, you could probably not be facing customers. So I like the distinction he gave to me because as a data scientist, you want to be facing customers. Because you want to hear the story from the horse's mouth. You will find that by the time if the story comes from the sales guy or from your manager, it gets so muddled that you don't know what is actually happening. And if you don't collect your facts right, you will not get the, the right information and you will not be the right, or you will not be thinking the right. Right? So 
So, for example, I talk about Oracle Retail, right? So, uh, Oracle Retail, one of the uh, products we had was pricing. So, so, basically, you know, one of the strategies that companies follow in pricing, I'm sure you guys already are aware of this, is markdown. So what they do is, at the beginning of the season, they'll start off with a very high price. You know, you'll find dresses that are priced at, say, $50. And over time, you'll find that the price has drifted down to $50. And you can buy the same dress that you were that was selling in uh, summer for $50. It's suddenly selling in, in uh, December for $50. Right. So that is the concept of markup. Right. So there is a whole whole uh, you know, field of data science focused on pricing. So we were supposed to you know, build these models for, for pricing for, uh, for Walmart and for uh, Bloomingdale. But somehow the models that we would make would not work. You know, we, they would run out of inventory. You know, what would happen is we would tell them to take a markdown, and they would uh, come back saying you know, everything sold out. As soon as we took a markdown, everything cleared. That was not the goal. The goal was still to stagger the sales uh, over a over a right over the season, and not have all the sales in, in you know, right away at the first day you take the markdown. So over time we learned that you know. The information that we were getting from our sales guys was, was misleading us, and that's why we were taking markdowns early on because they were not telling us as to you know the strategy that the customer is following. The customer is actually waiting for a markdown. So if you are saying, okay, I am going to take a markdown, and the customer is saying, okay, I am going to wait for the markdown. I am not going to buy anything until the markdown is taken. Right? So that's the kind of information you can only get by by going to the floor of the shop and understanding what is going on. So that's what I mean by you know having great connect with the customer and trying to figure out what is there exactly is happening. Because that will influence the assumptions that you're making in your model will be you know 90% influencing the success of your project. Much more than the information that's been coming out of your data. So did you actually talk to customers on the sales floor? No, I mean that was the project that failed. Oh, okay. <laughs> so so <laughs> the only thing is I learned because you know, I came up with a strategy for how to stagger those markdowns, mm -hmm. and then you know they started implementing those strategies, and from that we saw that there was an improvement in the sales. So I mean, although in that case I did not go to the floor, but I noticed that the information that was coming to us from the sales guys was not accurate. Okay. Beware of company politics, <laughs> right? So I mean, we already talked about this, and I'm sure you know. How many people here have work experience? Right? A decent amount, right? So I'm sure you know you guys have already experienced some of the company politics already, right? And that is something like because you are the ones who are coming in to take a change, so you can be sure there will be company politics going on around you, right? So, this, so that means two things. First is you have to be aware of the company politics, and second is you have to figure out strategies to avoid it, right? So, how, so you guys. Uh, you are nodding your head about company politics. So, do you have any suggestions for me as to how I can avoid company politics? Keep your head down. Don't don't get into it. Okay. I mean, some of it you just can't really help. It's like, like I had a position when I was working at Creighton University, and uh, the, my boss ended up quitting, and his boss got fired. So I kind of just got sucked into that mailstorm. Yeah. So I was just like. You just, you can't do anything about that, and just like I was, since it was higher education, everything moved super slow, and so it's like just things, just being aware of, like you know, hey, I need this next, uh -huh. and then you put you know that request in, it could be months since it's higher ed. It just yeah. takes forever. So just knowing how the the interaction between the departments work, and right. stuff, I found that just going and talking to the person instead of sending an email got things done so much faster. Right. That that's just kind of sure. my experience. So go ahead. Well, explain to them that you know, they actually help the business and everybody's going to benefit. That's nobody yep. cares about. You can say that as much as you like. Nobody wants to hear that. No. You can you know that's like, you know, uh soothing a baby. <laughs> you know, you can try as much as you want, but he's not understanding what you're saying. So it's not gonna work. So you have to relate to the individual person then. Okay. What does that mean to you? Well, depending on who you're talking. Okay. 
So that's so you have to understand the personalities of the people around. Right? Mm -hmm. Before you can start, you know, trying to send them a message, you have to listen to them. Right? Yeah. So we'll come to some, a little bit of that. We'll put, try to put some structure around these thoughts as we go forward. Four lessons that learned: science never fails, business does. Right? Mm -hmm. So business businesses fail all the time, right? But businesses, you know, so this is what happens. So whenever a company wants to change, you know, the first thing they do is they hire a consultant, and mostly they know what change they want the consultant the consultant to propose. They already know, but the point is, if they go and tell their employees that this is the change they're bringing in. Their employees will be, you know, not very really happy about those changes. But when they hear it from a third party, they're okay with it. That's just human nature. You know, we believe that you know a third party would have will be unbiased, and that's why they'll be bringing in knowledge that is unbiased in nature, which may not necessarily be true. The managers might just hire a third party, knowing that you know the third party will follow the decision he's already proposed to make, and he might bring somebody in. So as a data scientist, if you're being in broad end, that is the 90 in 90% of cases, that will be the role you'll find yourself. That the people that have that have run that <coughs> business already have something in mind as to what they want to do. They just want it validated by a third party. Especially if it can be a PhD or somebody who everybody thinks is intelligent, all the better. Right? So you become aware of that as to how much of your data science is going to be able to influence the business is very important for you as a data scientist, right? I mean, I'm sharing some of these nuggets, you know, because based on my 15 years of experience, you know, not every person would talk about these things, but, you know, what I've also learned as a data scientist is, you know, one of my strategies in terms of improving the culture as well as the work ethic is to be as open as possible. Talk about your problem, talk about the challenges you're facing with as many people as possible. Good. So it's uh, treatise, are they planning to change their business, their company? So they are hiring you to, so you'll be a consultant that will be, that will go and, uh, you know, be a, represent, a consultant for a third party. Okay. So you will go and change somebody else's business and treatise will be, you know, basically uh, your employer and you, they'll get paid because, you know, you are their consultant. Does that make sense? So, so basically, <coughs> two trends emerging in US, right? Mm -hmm. Companies like Facebook with their own data scientists and companies which hire right. data scientists from right. consulting companies. You talk about that. You talk about that. Very good point. Right? So these are definitely two different trends. And sometimes they work for you and sometimes they work against you. Right? There is advantages to both strategies. Right? So we'll talk about that. Like, uh, yeah. Okay. Let them learn. Science doesn't happen in cubicles, but in conferences. Right. So, how many of you have worked as engineers in companies? Only you. Only you. Okay. 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 So, you know, the first thing that will happen is, is when you get hired, you'll be given a cubicle. You'll be told, you know, this is the cubicle you are going to be sitting in. And, you know, oftentimes your boss will come and visit you in the cubicle and he'll ask you, you know, how you're performing, what, what's going on. And this, right. As a data scientist, is most likely the same thing will happen again. Somebody will give you a cubicle and say, you know, this is the place to sit and get some work done. Right? I guarantee you, you will not get anything done in that cubicle. <laughs> right? As a data scientist, you won't get anything done in that cubicle. You will have to walk to people, you will have to talk to people, you will have to understand people. And I keep emphasizing this again and again because you will find that most of the information that you need to do your job properly is with people. It might not even be the data. Right? But as a data scientist, you will have to give structure to their thoughts, structure to their ideas, structure to their, the model that they have in their mind, and you know, translate those thoughts into experiments. Right? So on that note, I'll, I'll just throw another question at you guys. One of the questions I always wonder about is, you know, how people view life. Right? So there's four possible options. You, know, you can say life is Life is a classroom. I'm always learning in the, in the classroom. Right? Or you can say life is a project. Or you can say life is a uh, is an experiment. Or you can say life is a party. Right? <laughs> right? So uh, so I'm going to throw all those four options again at you, and I'm going to ask you to raise hands. 
us to which, which of the four options you go for, right? So what do you think? Is life a party? <laughs> How many people who want to raise their hands to that? I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I wish it was. Yep. <laughs> All right. Actually, I think it's always a party. It's always a party, okay? Yeah. So three people with a party, okay? So now, uh, life is a classroom. How many? Yeah, but I think party is a crash. <laughs> okay, so is life a is a life a project? No, not too much project. Is life an experiment? Okay, it it, it always is un, until you die. So of course, <laughs> right. experiment, right? Every experiment is you know it has some time time limit to it. You can't have an experiment running forever. So that's true, right? So okay. All right, so we'll come back to this question later on. When I talk for other things, it will become relevant as why I ask this question. This is the most important lesson if you want to succeed as a data scientist. Keep a log. Every day, you know, you have to have a record of what happened during the day. You know, it could be the most trivial thing that have happened, but make a note. Because you will find after a month, you will forget everything that happened. And you will be Catching your head going, you know, what kind of question did I have with whom? What did we talk about? You know, what was discussed? How is this relevant for what I'm doing today? Because people will expect you to remember all these things, you know, as, as soon as they talk about it, right? For example, I work in Infosys. Even today in Infosys, people will just make a phone call to me and start talking about their project, right? And they will expect that within half an hour, they will just continue talking for half an hour and then expect me to remember everything they talked about. This is the expectation people have from you. Because firstly, they think you are very intelligent, you are very smart, you are the data scientist, you are the most intelligent person in the company. Right? That's the expectation they set for you. So, you have to be, of course, you know, we are all limited in our faculty. You know, we don't have the kind of memory that, you know, you would like to have. So, you have to compensate that by following certain processes and procedures. And keeping a logbook is a very good procedure. Because it does multiple things. Firstly, it keeps a record of what, what you have talked about with people. And secondly, for example, I used to run a dry cleaning business. One of the businesses I used to run was a dry cleaning business. So what the dry cleaning business was, was, you know, uh, a driver would, you know, start in the morning. He would start with a van. He would go to different locations and pick up people's dry cleaning. And the next day, he would drop off their dry cleaning after, you know, the dry cleaning has been. So he would not do any dry cleaning. He would just be doing pick up and drop off. So I had put together a software where he could record at every location what is going on. You know? So he would go to his mobile phone, he would record, okay, I, here I met this customer, this is what I did, blah, blah, blah. So what he found was over time, customers would ask him, you know, why didn't you come here tomorrow? You know, I mean, why didn't you come here yesterday? And then because he had a record, he could say, no, no, look at my record. I came here yesterday at this time. And just because he had it written in his book, people would believe it much more than if he said that you know, I came here. I mean, he could have gone back and just written it, you know, after after the time. But the fact that he had it in a log book convinced people that he was telling the truth. So that's something you'll find a lot of time happening to you in the company. That people will say, you know, did we talk about this yesterday? Did we not talk about this yesterday? Do you have any proof that we did talk about it? So having a log book it helps you through all these conversations. And you will build credibility. As a data scientist, you will need to build a lot of credibility in the company. So people will understand you through the processes you follow. And the more they think that you are very methodical in what you do, the more trust they will have in you. So you have to convince them that you are following processes. I mean, you can understand that I am not talking about any data science here. I am just talking about the ethics and the work ethic of a data scientist. Because that is what I think I want you to carry after you are done with this course, much more than, you know, all the logs, because I told you already, I'll give you a, a, a pen drive with 100 books on it. So you will have more information than you can study in your whole lifetime. But I want you to de develop an ethic, a work ethic, that is much more important than, you know, the knowledge that you have. Does that make sense? Yes. Seven slides in learn. Keep it simple, stupid, right? I mean, we, we know this lesson by heart, but uh, as we learn more things, it just becomes so so much more difficult. Because we, we start thinking that the only way we can prove our smartness is by talking about complex things. Right? But 
you will usually find that firstly businesses need very simple uh, changes. They don't need big changes because mostly they can cannot handle big changes. You know, if you change, make a big change and you know nobody understands what you've changed, there will be repercussions. There will be assumptions that you're making, and the system will start responding to the assumptions that you're making. And because now you have you know made all these changes, and the system can't handle all the assumptions that you didn't take into account, the system will collapse. Right? So you have to keep it very simple. For example, you know you will we will talk about prediction. We will talk about in the context of prediction, we will talk about forecast. You'll have to make forecast. You know, you'll have to look at the past data, and you might, you might have to say, okay, my store yesterday it sold five uh, five yellow shirts, and today it will sell ten red shirts. You know, because I saw five yellow shirts sell yesterday, I think there'll be ten yellow shirts, red shirts selling today. Right? Now, what will happen is that as a, as an engineer or as a statistician, you will always wonder, isn't there noise in my data? If I'm looking at five shirts, couldn't put that is that five number five really the true number of shirts I would have sold, or is that a noisy piece of data? And can I make a decision based on this noisy piece of data? Right. But you will find that you have to start by assuming that your data is clean. I mean, no, not clean, but at least deterministic. You, know, you have to start with simple deterministic models that don't bring in any stochasticness, and see what kind of results you start getting. Because there's very little improvement that you will notice by adding complexity to your model. Suppose you manage to improve the business by, you know, suppose the business was making one million dollars before you introduced your concept, and you introduced your concept of, you know, changing the forecast uh, and made it a deterministic forecast. You will notice that okay, you know, so this might go from one million to one million hundred thousand. Now you bring in a, a stochastic model. The sales most, most likely will go from 100,000, 1 million, 100,000 to 1 million, 110,000. It won't be a significant increase. So, there, so there's a law of limiting uh, growth with, the, with the bringing in all these changes. So you have to make as simple changes as possible to start with and then look for improvement, more complex improvements after you've noticed the, the influence that these uh, changes have had on your business. Is this making sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So as a data scientist, you should always start by proposing very simple models and then go on to make more complex models as the needs come. But if you can do with simple models, don't go to complex models. Again, we talked about this already in different ways. Build excellent communication and emailing skills. I mentioned emailing because there will be jobs where you will be totally judged by the kind of emails you send out. Right? It will not be about you know what math you did, but the kind of because it's one thing to get ideas. The real value is in communicating those ideas. If you don't communicate those ideas, then the value of having that having that idea is zero. Agree with me? Mm -hmm. Right. So put some real effort into figuring out. You know, find some books that say teach you how to write good emails that fit into your business requirements. You know, make some effort in this direction. Where you say, okay, you know, I need to improve my communication skills as much as possible. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Final lesson learned. Every Monday you should approach your boss with a new idea. Right? Like I said, you've been hired to have ideas. Right? But now I'm going to tell you a procedure that you should follow very strictly because it will teach you a lot about whether you're going to succeed in your job or not. So go every Monday to your boss, spend your Saturday, Sunday coming up with an idea. Go to your boss on Monday, give him this idea. And then, see how far this idea is percolated in a company of by Friday. Right? <laughs> Does somebody come back to you by Friday and start talking to you? I heard that you have this idea, or I heard somebody had this idea. What do you think about this idea? It could be your idea, but somebody will be telling you as a third person that I heard this idea from somewhere. Right? So this will be, if this happens, like by Friday somebody comes and talks to you about your idea, that means you're in, the good in, in a good environment. But if that is not happening, that means, you know, you need to change your environment. You can change your environment by changing the culture in the company that you're in, or you can change your company. Either way. <laughs> so, so. Okay, next slide. 
Friday management. So how many, I guess very few of you have tried, uh, have, a, uh, have worked in companies before, but uh, you all have managed projects, right? You have managed your academic projects and this and that, right? So you, must, so you might follow some project management principles, right? If you have worked as a software engineer in a company, you will notice that project management skills count a lot. Because your, your boss will rarely ask you, what are you doing? He will ask you, when will you get done? Right? He will want to know what you think about when you will get done with whatever you do. He will not want to know what is the content or the quality of what you do. Because he has deadlines to meet and he's a, he has a whole chain to, chain to follow. So he, you know, as, a, as a software engineer, you will always be asked, when, did, when, will, when do you think you will get done? In fact, most meetings of software engineers are hardly about what they are going to do, they are mostly about when will you get done. So now when you become a data scientist, that's the environment you will find yourself in. Although you think of yourself as a scientist, your company will think of you as an engineer. So they will have the same expectation that when you come to them, you will be able to tell them when will you get done. And I will tell you the biggest challenge is a data scientist. Whatever time you think will take you to do something, it will take you three times the time. You can imagine as much as you like. You will say, okay, this will take me nine months, so I'm going to propose 27 months. <laughs> right? And it will take you 27 months. It will take you, if you are thinking 27 months, it will, if you are even imagining that it will take you 27 months, it will end up taking you 78 months. Right? So that is the biggest challenge of the data science, that most data science projects fail because somebody is not being able to figure out how much time this project takes. And if you get done early, they think that you're... No, you'll never get done early. Like, <laughs> that to that. If that is happening, that means you're not doing what you're, what you're supposed to be doing. Okay. Wait, that, <coughs> that means uh, your initial model is missing a lot of variables. Definitely. Because who are the variables here? Your, your colleagues are your variables. So this is a lot of unknowns. Right. A lot of unknowns, right? So you don't know, you don't know your colleagues, you don't know your customers. You know, I'll talk about this very explicitly later on. But you will find that data science is also a lot more about psychology than about math, right? And in fact, there's a whole field about, that talks about the psychology of math. What is the psychology that goes behind math itself? So, no. so uh, as a data scientist, you will have to understand a lot about you know, how people think and how what what success means to them. You will find that success itself means different things to different people. Your boss might be saying, you know, if you open another store, that's success. And his boss might be saying, if you close another store, that's success. Right? So the definitions will change from, from person to person. And as a data scientist, you will have to create that awareness that you don't, you keep yourself as objective as possible when you go into a job. Right? Especially, suppose, sir, say you're going as a representative of data. Right? You will find that you will have to really understand the customers of data before you can deliver something new. You have to understand the environment because now you're representing students. It's not just about you representing yourself, but you're, you're representing students. So understanding how students want to approach that customer, how that customer wants to be approached, all that becomes very critical when you're performing a job as a student. Okay, now we'll talk about the psychology of an organization. So we'll be talking about you know psychology in this and that different terms. Now I try to put some structure around, and we'll even come back to the question of what is life, right? So different people handle conflict differently. What I mean is, when you have a conversation with somebody, what does that mean? It usually starts off by either you engaging your 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 uh, uh, the other person or the other person coming to engage you. It often starts with an engagement. Somebody is trying to engage somebody, right? Then what will happen is in, in, especially in US, I have noticed that a lot of emphasis is paid on, paid on empathizing. You have to empathize with people. You know, if you want people to share information with you, you want to empathize with them. In India, it's a little different. In India, you tend to analyze information much more than empathize with people. You know, it's just a different culture. So, so the second process in any conversation is you try to empathize. Like, for example, I ask you, you know, who bought you the telescope? So, uh, I mean, I asked Elliot who, who bought it. So, things like that, you know, things you have to connect with people before we can share information. 
information. Right? So as a data scientist, because you are in the business of, of uh, extracting information, you have to get into the habit of empathizing, which comes naturally in you as anyways. So I should not have to even mention that, but I just want to make it explicit. The third thing in a conversation is analyze. So you actually analyze the information that you are getting from the person, or the person analyzes the information that they are getting from. The fourth step in any conversation is disengagement. Because disengagement itself is a part of that conversation. So you have to be very good at all these four steps to have a, have a coherent conversation with anybody. Right? So this is very interesting actually because, you know, if you, so one of the things, uh, if all the people that have business degrees, they might be very familiar with the idea of coordinates. How about you? Did you find in business school that you were learning a lot about quadrants or you try to put all information in quadrants? Right? So we will talk about things in that context for a moment. So the idea of quadrants is you can you can take you know whatever space you have and divide it into four squares and you know you can place information in those four squares. So the information that we want to capture right now is how how do people behave? So there are people that like to ask things and there are people that like to tell things. Right. And then there are people that, you know, like to talk about feelings, and then there are people that like to talk about facts. Right. So now we have four quadrants. We have a quadrant where people ask feelings, where people tell feelings, where people ask facts, and people tell facts. Right. And this is something you find that you can easily categorize people in an organization in these four categories. In fact, the way I do it is that most engineers like to ask facts. If you tell an engineer it's warm outside, what do you think an engineer will say? You say, what is the temperature? Right. He will ask you for information. Right. Then there's a project manager. If you tell a project manager it's warm outside, he will say, okay, why don't you go for a walk? No. He will tell you to do something. Right. He will basically be sharing some facts with you and he will be telling you some uh, based on those facts you know, that you have to take an action. That's the nature of project management. Then there are the CEOs of a company. They like to empathize with people. Even if the company is failing, their job is not to worry about the company is failing, but keeping the morale high. Right? So the way they keep morale high is by empathizing with people. People need to believe in them. You know, because success and, and failure can be changed as long as people believe in you. And then comes the final step, the data scientist. He like he should be in the habit of telling people things. You know, as a data scientist, keep that as a motto. You know, you should always share your feelings with everybody. And uh, you know, it almost sounds very mushy, but but actually, it's a fact that the reason, you know, the how do hypotheses happen? The way hypotheses happen is somebody shares their feelings about something, right? And that. Feeling, when you're sharing that feeling, then two people get together and start talking about it, and then it translates into hypothesis. So, you will be judged by the number of hypotheses you're coming up with every week. Like I said, the idea, the concept of coming up with an idea on Monday. You can even think of that as a hypothesis. You should be able to come up with a hypothesis every Monday. So, it is that job of your sharing your feelings about things that will make you a successful data science. That will help you create your own work. It's only when you go and share your feelings and they translate into a hypothesis that somebody will say, okay, where does this hypothesis from? And at that time, you can even rely on an analyst. Even an analyst can test a hypothesis. But coming up with a hypothesis is what makes your data science. Now, making sense? Right? So, this is where I wanted to talk about, you know, uh, the other aspect of a conversation. So, if you notice, I've captured those four aspects of a conversation. And put them on the four uh, people, right? You see that? Does everybody see that? Right? So what I've done there is basically I have tried to analyze how people handle conflict. So the way people handle conflict is based on the four different types, the four different components of a conversation. The way a uh, CEO handles conflict is by empathizing with people. The way an engineer handles conflict is by analyzing. It. The way a project manager handles information is by engaging people. So you'll find if you put two project managers in a room, they will bite each other's head off. <laughs> because 
location and I'm like, yes, I need to grab the data. Yeah. How are you promoting the process? You know, so when it's saturated, the process is going to be like, exactly, like, like I'm trying to provide a solution, but I need you to help me figure out where to start. And so like, there was one of the guys, uh, I talked to him, he's like, oh, you need to talk to Dennis over there. And I went and talked to Dennis, and I learned way more than what I, but it was like, good, good. Now like I have a great foundation. Now I can actually go and get some. Does, does it help to become uh, a way of coding together? One other thing when I was uh, kind of puzzled is um, like in terms of like SQL, like, you know, there's like. But when I did research it, I, can, I, I found a lot of the form. information people had imported. They just were actually because of public people. Okay, correct. So in the
Doesn't the most organization data science does both of those things? In most organizations, you'll find yourself, you know, you might even be working as a janitor of the company. <laughs> <laughs> so, so don't be surprised because companies, you know, they have, they need every kind of person, but they have, they work with a limited team. Right? So, you know, you that is just the nature of being an employee, not about being a data scientist. You'll find as an employee, you'll find yourself doing all kinds of things. That you should be get comfortable on as an employee. Thank you. Now you'll find that people that you know uh, are motivated to do something but still try to join startup. Because a startup gives them that environment that they can be doing everything. They can be buying their laptops, they can be installing software on the laptop. You get involved with a big company, they will not let you touch anything. They will say, we will ship your laptop to you when it's ready. Just sit on your desk for three months. So it's your decision as to how you want to take it. You want to appreciate you know, the opportunities you're getting, or you want to think of them as a distraction. One more thing, uh, India is famous for IT, right? Yeah. How come Krizant is not bringing data scientists from India? Huh? Yeah, that's... that's, that's uh, that was what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, so that was their earlier model. The last two years, they've been getting uh, crazy people from India. The cost of the thing. But uh, thanks to Trump. Huh? Yeah. Thanks to Trump. Trump. Oh, because, because he's sitting in a visa. They're tightening on the visa. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, that is why Canada was a big thing. That is why we are into the business. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the elephants. But I'll also tell you that, you know, if a data scientist does not belong to a culture, you will not understand how to communicate with that culture. That's true. So you need to belong to a culture to be able to communicate with that culture. So, for example, I'll just tell you a bit about the Indian culture. I bought a lab, a computer from Dell. Yes. Okay. They, <laughs> so, so my computer failed. They, uh, so I called the customer service. Customer service was the uh, office somewhere in Chandigarh in India. Right. So I started talking to this guy and I said, my computer is failing. He said, don't worry, I'll ship you a new one. A week passed, nothing happened. They're called back again. He says, uh, don't worry, I, I will make sure this time something happens. By the way, how did I do on my call? So I was like, get me my computer. Man. Like, who cares about your call? Get me my computer. Right? <laughs> so I call him the next week. Again, nothing has happened. So I call him the next week. He says, you know, the guy who was servicing you has gone home because his sister is having a wedding. But please give him a good rating because. Uh, <laughs> 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 and I'm saying, you know, I've become your family member. But all I want is my computer. Right? So that's the difference in culture, right? Yeah. In India, if I was sitting in India, what he was saying would make perfect sense to me. Right? But I would be belonging to that style of thinking. But because I'm sitting in US, I think differently now. So I question that. I say, no, what is this guy telling me? Right? I mean, I, all I want is my computer. I'm suddenly becoming his family member. Right? It's a question. It's like, you know. Culture makes a big difference in terms of how you approach people and how you interact with people. Yeah, they are now getting into a right balance. Uh, the customer facing, they will have uh, people with uh, local with cultural background who can interface with customer better. And when it gets into the actual detail coding world, most of the stuff uh, will be done on the way. So that I means most of the uh, data mangling is going to be done in there. Right. So the point is, you might not even have to. You know, you really have data. to be a data scientist. You have, your job is to come up with hypotheses. That's your real job. I, I like that, but also most get a lot of experience in data mangling because uh, I read most of the data science work, work in US is uh, data mangling right now. Yeah. So that any will happen the way it is happening now. They are sending people to customer sites to understand the database, uh, 
to the data mining, come up with a value prop, right? Then you have to convince customers before they can buy into your idea. So all those front end work is done for you. And only after getting the order, yes. when you need a bigger team, yes. they are trying to pass uh, from you. That's okay. where the real margins are. The real margins are in what you are going to be doing, not in the actual data analysis. The real margin is in coming up with that. So the just provide most value to the client. Yes. Because many customers don't know what they want. Right? So that's yes. where you have to yes. tell them what they want. Yeah, you know. <laughs> you had a prime example, you can scale the team sometimes. Uh, but most of the customers are like that. And that is where credence will send maybe one, two guys. And then when they come up with a good value prop, then they expand on the scope. And they... mm. Anyway, yeah. sorry, yeah. I took more time. Yeah. No, that's, that's a very interesting. I just want to tell another story on this. I was working with JP Morgan. And basically, so the, a lot of the data that they had was trade card data. So what, what, what kind of data? Trade card data. Because they had chains. Oh, okay. Chains, right? Yeah. So chains, they had, you know, they could claim to have 20% of trade card data. Right? Okay. Uh, we create that transaction as a description string attached to it that describes what the data is. That transaction. And the merchant where the transaction was performed is buried in that gun, in that right. So, of course, like we talked about, you know, this data could mean anything. Like we, the first slide I showed you is that, you know, uh, the same name could imply two different companies or the same company can have two different names. Right. So, just because a, a transaction says WALMT, that does not necessarily mean it's coming from Walmart. It could be from a subsidiary of Walmart. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, to use this data, they needed to make sure that they are getting the right budget. Right. So, JP Morgan, the team I was working with, they had a third party, ten, ten engineers from a third party, to categorize, to uh, uh, properly annotate the data. Okay. Right. So these guys were working for nine months, and they had managed to annotate forty percent of the data. So I got interested in the project, what these guys are doing. You know, so I built some algorithms. Despite trial and test, I came up with some ideas and I started building some algorithms. Within a month, I got that uh, analysis down to 90%. I managed to finish 90% of it. Wow. Right? And using very simple tricks. I mean, I'm not saying that I did something very intelligent. I was just using some simple tricks that these guys were not using because they were not looking at the data the same way I was doing. My boss called me to the office. He said, Pratik, please stop working on this stuff. Please do or don't. Don't. Don't, don't work on it anymore. So I said, what, what's wrong? What did I do wrong? He said, you know, you're making the other team look bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what I'm trying to say is, I did not grasp the complexity of what I was doing. That the goal of the company is to have some relationship with this third party. And I'm interfering in that relationship. <laughs> So understanding the objectives of your customer is very important. Sure. And it could be much more complex than, you know, simply, you know, increase my sales or, you know, grow my company. It's interesting. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> so, so basically, the most important questions are the ones you're not aware of quite often. Okay. So what is a good method for? For example, there's this joke that the scientist comes to his classroom, a professor comes to the bathroom and starts teaching. And he says, what is the most important question in the world today? One of the students gets up and says, sir, the problem with you over here. That is the most important question. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the nature. Like everybody thinks their problem is the most important. You're, you're going to figure out what other people. So what are some good um, leading questions to ask people to get them to divulge what their problem is? Right. Well, so you start by empathizing. Empathizing, okay. People will talk with you if you empathize with them. Okay. Of course, you know, different people are different. So figuring out how you will integrate. How, with yeah. Empathizing looks different for each person. Yeah. 
That's why I was showing you the psychology of a company. You have to understand, you have to be able to categorize how each person is thinking in your company and be able to respond to them in that fashion. Okay. Sure. Just because somebody is an engineer does not mean he thinks like an engineer. It's your job to figure out how he really thinks. Gotcha. But then, how, do you, how does your client, right? So we have started our class, right? Okay. Did we start our class? Go ahead, go ahead. Ask your question. How does the client find out, uh, I mean, decide to hire you for the consultant versus other companies? Huh? How does the client decide to uh, hire that uh, data science company, consulting right. company, versus another one? Right. So, like I said, I've been hired by 15 or 14 companies. Right? Yes. There, there's never a consistent pattern as to how you get hired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes the person just likes your face. Sometimes he likes your resume. Sometimes he likes what you talk about. You know? Sometimes he likes how you did in your exams. You, know, you were given an exam, you did well. Gotcha. Thank you. I mean, see, the hiring and firing process is the most complicated process. So you'll get hired for your strengths, and you'll get fired for your weaknesses. Okay. Every person has strengths and weaknesses. So, so figuring out you know, where your weaknesses are beginning to influence your job situation is something you have to be very aware of. Okay. That's why I said keep a law book. Always keep a law book. So the law book will teach you a lot about you know how well you're doing. So, okay, psychology for data science. How many here believe that they can forecast anything? Huh? Probably not, right? But 90% of your job will be about forecast. Somebody will be asking you to forecast all the time. So, that's the world you're living in, right? So, how do you counter that? The way you counter that is by understanding what that forecast actually means. You know, somebody says, you know, how many shirts am I going to sell tomorrow? Right? What he's not asking is how many shirts he's going to sell you that he's going to sell tomorrow. What he's asking is how many shirts should he make? Okay. So understanding what decisions are linked to that forecast is much more important than the forecast. Okay. So well, Whenever you get into a situation where your customer asks you to forecast, you have to make make sure that you clearly understand what decisions he's trying to make using that. And until he gives you an answer to that question, you don't let go. Because you're just inviting trouble by giving him a forecast without understanding what he's trying to do. Mm -hmm. Right? What is intelligence in artificial intelligence? Why do we need intelligence? So, data science is pretty much about behavior modification. You will find yourself, you know, the decisions that you make are going to influence your customers. They are going to influence the way your customers make decisions. The way, you know, your employee, you know, suppose you are in the kind of project where a company is trying to influence its employees through the decisions it make. Mostly you will find your decisions will be involved in influencing humans. Okay. That's where intelligence comes in. The reason there is intelligence in artificial intelligence is because you have to deal with humans. And to deal with humans, you need, you need intelligence. Is that making sense to everybody? Okay. Right? So be aware of that. You know, whenever, for example, you know, you could have automation. And you could be using the same principle. You can be writing programs to do automation. But uh, automation is not intelligence. So you have to understand, you know, where which part of your work is actually involving intelligence, and make sure that that is being highlighted in whatever you're doing. Now, making sense. So basically, people are the critical factors, not the process of the machine. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So this is the thing. What what happens when people We've already kind of talked about this, but I'll bring it up again. Everybody in the organization believes that you're the smartest person around. Right? So what does that mean? What 
what usually happens when people think you're smarter than them. Go ahead. Uh, they expect you to be confident in things you're saying to them. Okay, that's the first reaction. What is the second reaction? They like you. Huh? They might not like you. They would not like you. Right? <laughs> they would want to challenge whatever you're saying. Right. Because, you know, you become their competition. Okay? You might be the other. Well, they, might, they might challenge you without believe that you're really that smart. Right. 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 So a lot of things will happen. A lot of things will happen. I'm not asking you to react to these things. I'm just saying that be aware of these. You don't need to respond to these things because a lot of things will be under your control. Because finally, you are also human. There's only so much you can do mentally or process mentally. But being aware makes you understand where you stand. Okay. So don't react negatively. Like you said, like a lot of people already said, I'm just doing my job. That's not not somebody, not something anybody wants to hear. So having that thought in your head is just filling your position in the company or in the organization. The reason people are approaching you is because they think you're intelligent. So you have to now convince them that your intelligence is for their benefit. Right? That's how you win that battle. And that's why, it's, okay, so the reason I brought up philosophy and you talked about, I'll bring it up again. Mm -hmm. So it's only when I read philosophy that I understood that like, most of philosophy is about building paradise. When Plato talks about something, or when Aristotle talks about something, he's building paradise. You know, he says, what are words? Words are, ask, you know, are messages coming to me from, from the heaven. And, you know, words are like chariots that lead me to heaven. Right? So he built a model of what uh, words mean in a very philosophical fashion. Right? So the reason it is interesting is because he's building paradise to con communicate his ideas. He's giving a lot of importance to words. What role do words play in our daily life? Right? That's what you'll find yourself doing a lot of time. That you will have ideas, but you'll have to bring people to the, to the same page as you. You'll have to build paradigms to explain to them what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why a lot of different pieces, besides just you know, math and uh, engineering, will influence your role as a data scientist. You know? So get into the habit of reading a lot beyond just you know, math and science. Uh, to become a good data scientist. How paradigms get built? How do you present an idea? You know, that becomes very critical in your success as a data scientist. Am I making sense? Does anybody have questions on this? Yeah, how, how, uh, I, I, I took like a uh, lot of uh, applied math modeling, but how, how do you learn to develop paradigms? Because we, there's no formal training I'm aware of. Right. Mostly it is by practice. Yes. So do a lot of projects. Yeah. 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 So the way I, I do it personally is I write a lot. Yes. Right. Write a lot. Yeah. Because you know, and that's something I you know I talked about writing the beginning also when I said you know my father taught me the trick of never reading a book before you finish writing it. You know? So it's only when you write that you are begin to understand what your thoughts are, and then you start to start understanding what they mean. So get into the habit of writing a lot. Because you know, you will find, you know, you write something and a month later you read what you wrote and you'll surprise yourself. You'll say, What what was I thinking? <laughs> what did I write this for? <laughs> so you'll be surprising yourself every month by just reading every month what you wrote a month ago. Because on the day that you think about it, you say, Okay, this is so obvious, you know. Why do I need to even jot this down? But a month later you read it, you say, wow, what the hell was I thinking at that time? So, so you will surprise yourself by writing a lot. See, that's the other thing I learned when I was doing my PhD. Uh, quality, right? So how was your PhD experience? Did you have to write a lot? Uh, yes. I 
question and I thought I was done. So I was like, you know, I've done my experiment, I'm getting my results. Now I think I've, I've built a lab and I'm, I'm all done. So I went to my boss and I said, you know, when do I finish my piece? He says, have you written anything? I said, no, I have not written anything, but I think I have all the results. He said, okay, start writing. You know? And it took me five years from that point of him telling me to start writing that I actually because it takes a lot of time. And the first time I wrote something and I took, took to my boss's boss, and you know, my, the professor who was my boss's boss, he just threw me out of the office. He said, you know, your, what you've written is below my standards to even read. So the point is, from that point, you know, I got to a point where he finally approved my thesis. So it can be done, but you have to be at it. So, so writing, so writing a lot change the way how you think. Exactly, and also how I present. Right, right. Because what, again, I said the same thing, right? You write something, a month later you read what you wrote. You say, what's the answer to the same thing? Right. So now you're finding holes in your own writing. Is that is at that time that your thinking starts to? Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we already talked about this. There needs to be a method to your madness. Right? And companies will come and see you do all, all kinds of crazy things. And you want to suggest all kinds of crazy things. And you know, people will question whatever you're suggesting. And for example, keeping a law book is one way of presenting method to your madness. Right? But you have to, you know, follow many such tricks to get to a point where people will start believing in what you're saying. For example, um, one of the things I did was I uh, set up, I built a, a blog in the company. Whichever company I worked for, I always made sure that there was a blog in place where people were sharing their ideas. Right? So now, you know, because there was a blog, people have a tendency to write much more on a blog than they would talk to each other. So now you start capturing things that they are really thinking about, and then you know, people start believing that much more than they believe the actual conversation they have with each other. Things like that. So you have to figure out different ways in which technology can improve, you know, the, the work environment and how it can help you capture more ideas. You know, making sense? For example, nowadays, pretty much every company you'll find that people just build a WhatsApp group. It becomes something so common that it's even penetrated the work culture. So people just build a WhatsApp group and start sharing ideas on WhatsApp group. So, so noticing those things and you know making it as a, as a part of your exercise and introducing them in a company can notice can make a big change in the success level that you're seeing. Captured information. So I used to be crazy about capturing information. I used to record every conversation I had with everybody at some point. And that has kind of gone down now. But you know, so the point is, you know. But I learned a lot in that phase of my life when I used to, I used to record all my conversations. Because there were so many things I noticed I was missing in conversation. Only when I started capturing those conversations through recording that I started most mostly. But that's how good you have to become. I mean, that is true for pretty much every job. 90% you know? of your success is again dependent on how well you're capturing it. Understand people through processes they follow. Right? I already gave you the example of you know my boss uh, calling me to his office and saying you know it, it is you please stop working on this project. So it's only at that time that I realized what processes he follows, what is important to him, and how he is conducting himself. You know how he determines you know what signals he needs to respond to, and so that's something you need to understand about the people that you interact with. Assess whether your employee really needs you. <laughs> what that means is you're going in as a, uh, with your role as a data scientist. Right? We talked about already the fact that you, know, you might find yourself working as a janitor in the same company. So that time you have to make a call as to whether you're actually contributing to the company or not. Because you will gain a lot of respect by being able to make that call early on. When you feel that you know you are not being able to contribute to an organization and you walk into an organization's office and you say, I'm not contributing anymore. It's time for me to come out. 
you will gain a lot of respect when you do that. And that respect will take you farther than, than you realize because message spreads, you know, people talk about you. Employers talk about you, your colleagues talk about you, your friends talk about you. You just can't escape that. So when, when you gain that respect, that respect will reflect in your in your growth as, as a scientist. Already talked about this. This is primarily what you're getting paid for. Expressing yourself, sharing your feelings. So get into that habit. Right? Get into the habit of talking about what you're feeling about any situation. So what I mean is, talk a lot more than you're talking right now. <laughs> so going forward, get into that habit. Build that habit about talk. Like if you don't understand something, question it. Challenge it right away. Don't hesitate. Okay. So now let's start talking a little more about uh, data itself. Right? So when we talk about the process structure, we'll talk a little more about this in much more detail. But right now I'll just introduce the concept that you will find that a company, a business would have a lot of their internal data. Like they're collecting transaction data, they're collecting fraud data, they're collecting uh, employee information, they're collecting store information, right? So they're collecting a lot of, lot of information. But that's just half of the data that they can use. The other half of the data is the data sitting in the world, right? external data, right? For example, companies, you know, could, any company could use the information about what's happening in every household in India, right? I might have a million customers today, but I still want to know what's happening in 300 million households across India. So that's external data. You know, I could take my million customers and then figure out which uh, which 10 million households in the US are good targets for my product. So now that requires me to get external data about every household. So it's internal data plus the external data that is your total data. It's not just the internal data. And what is web? Web is just data, right? So. So you will find yourself easily getting into the habit of thinking about web as data. You know, scraping data should be your your uh, natural instinct. You know, like I said, you know, you should always be thinking as an entrepreneur. You should be going home and saying, okay, what data can I scrape, and how can I translate it into business? That should be your instinct every day, okay. and that brings you to a lot of different concepts. For example, we should talk about programming. Make programming a habit. The way anything can become a habit is if you feel it's going to be useful for you, right? Otherwise, it's not going to become a habit. It's only when you feel that, okay, you know, you're gaining something by doing something every day, and you'll start doing it. You know? Most of us have gone through that process where we go to the gym a couple of days, and then we say, okay, fine, I'm done with it, right? Move on to the next. Because, you know, you don't get any feedback from the environment that your, your body is changing, or, you know, you just don't give it enough time. So it's the same thing with programming, it's the same thing with, and I think uh, data. That you have to get in the habit of thinking about data all the time and thinking about how to, how to convert data into making money. Because that's pretty much all you can do with data. You can only figure out how to use it to make money. Okay? So that should become your natural instinct, thinking about different forms of data, how to extract it, you know, like thinking about Twitter, thinking about uh, Facebook, thinking about how to use the social media data to make money for yourself. That should be a natural instinct. So you learn so much from that process that you know you will perform much better at your job. Because you'll find that your employer does not know as much as you do after you do that for six months. So so that was the, the second con the first concept is thinking about external data. Then you'll find yourself, you know, taking all this data and merging it together. And that's that's where you know the process of uh, data quality will come to play. The second layer from the bottom, where so you start thinking about what is the quality in the data that uh, I'm getting from my external sources, and how does my internal data compare to that data. So you will do a lot of uh, merging of the two data sets and comparison of the two data sets to figure out data quality. Okay. So where does the data quality? Believe me, if your data has 100% quality, you don't you don't need any data. No. So 90. So again, I, say, I keep repeating the 90% thing, but basically, you know, a lot of uh, the 
the effort that goes on as a data scientist comes into play because your data has it does not have good quality. So whatever you can fix using data quality, you should try to fix. So what will happen is once you have fixed this quality, you will move it into a data lake. How many of you are aware what a data lake is? Okay. Two people in back. So the concept of a data lake is basically like a data warehouse. What used to be called a data warehouse earlier is now called a data lake. Because you know data types have become much more much more complex now. And uh, you know, now nowadays there is the concept of no SQL data and non and non-relational data sets and unstructured data and unstructured data. So all the data nowadays gets put into one system which is often referred to as data lake. But pretty much it is nothing else but the data lake. Right? Oh, question. Do you put I don't think it's a question. Do you put raw data into our SQL and also the clean data? Same uh, clean data. I mean, process data also in SQL. In SQL, you, you can have everything, both dirty and clean data. So usually, you have the original data that you go get from any source. Right? Where do you usually put it? You put it in a data lake. Okay. What is the architecture of data lake usually? So data lake would uh, it's a so it's a complex thing. We'll talk about it in detail later on. But there's many components that go into a data lake. So for example, you know, you might have a Hadoop environment, somebody might build their data lake in a Hadoop environment. Yeah. Somebody might build their data lake in a green cloud environment. So different technology will come into play. And how data flows into that environment also changes. And how the data gets extracted from that environment also changes. Okay, so there's no one set answer. There's no one set answer. Got and it changes from business to business. Got different businesses make different decisions. Right? Main thing is as a data scientist, you will find yourself uh, using data much more than uh, you know managing data. So you will not hardly you will hardly need to understand you know how the data is going into the data lake or getting extracted. But again, you know, your employer can always come and say, okay, can you be a big data person? Does if, if you gain expertise in da uh, data engineering, would this give you an advantage of data scientist? Okay, that's a very interesting question. Because what is the definition of advantage? Uh, over other data scientists in getting gaining a critical business insight. In gaining critical business insight. No, it won't. It won't. Okay. Because critical business in, insight has to do, firstly, it has to do very little with data itself. Right? Like we already talked about. You have to understand the people. Yeah. yeah. Right. right? So, but, uh, you know, definitely it has to be, see, data will only tell you what you look for. Data is not going to come and give you information that you are not looking for. Okay. If you don't format the, formulate the right hypothesis, the data will never tell you what, what, the, what the right hypothesis is. Okay. Yes, gotcha. Thank so you. the only thing you can use data for is to validate your hypothesis. If you cannot use data to build your hypothesis. Okay. Cash. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Actually, China has a company where uh, they have a default rate of like three percent on uh, ready cash, and it's like five minutes to uh, approve them all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then it's a uh, machine learning algorithm. Great. China is doing a lot of stuff on machine learning.
anyway so once data goes, so before data can be used you know you might do all the you might do all the merging of the data and all the data aggregation and data uh, integration and put it in your database but to use that data you have to again clean that data mm -hmm. right? so again we talk about a lot of examples that you know you might find you might the person might create two identities for instance and for one problem they might be perfectly valid he might probably be valid to have two identities because one of the identities is a student and the other is as an employee uh, right? yep. so it might be that you know you just need information about all the employees you don't care about the student right? you just need uh, information about one identity but there might be a different problem where you need all the information possible whether it's a student or a or an employee right so so it is the problem that determines how you are going to clean the data. Sure. Now you will see a lot of videos when you start searching for this data analytics. You will see, you know, there will be videos that will show you a database, and then there will be a scrubber, a scrubber going on top of the data and cleaning the data, right? Mm -hmm. And that will be the message to communicate that that is data cleaning. Believe me, data cleaning has nothing to do with cleaning data. Right. Right. It is about making the data relevant for the problem that you are solving. So it's not dirty data or clean data that we are trying to focus on, but making sure that we are using the right data for uh, for the right problem. Okay. So then you will get into analytics. That is the part where all the machine learning and this and that will come into play. Okay. And then finally we will get into uh, into uh, the business outcome. So, you know, you do earlier, you run earlier version, you come up with the testing hypothesis, you come up with the right hypothesis, and then you try to convince the customer that, you know, this uh, hypothesis is relevant, and that's why the business, you'll be presenting the business outcome that will be, uh, you know, that could be targeted by the company. So, that's the nature of information work. It seems like the way this flows is also kind of the way where the class is structured. Exactly. So, you'll see that. Especially in my classes, you'll see a lot of layered architecture, and we'll talk about this again and again. And you know, so given any problem, you should try to fit it into different layer architectures. These are pretty simple actually. They, you could build layer architectures that are really complicated, and you should always think about your problem because the advantage of a layer layer architecture is because it creates reusability. You know, if you can think in a layered format, then you will create code that you can reuse. You will create concepts that you can reuse. You will create concepts that you can carry over to other other businesses, other business uh, lines. And you know, so it will create a lot of. Uh, uh, you will reduce your work, the required work, a lot. Okay. So that means an interesting one. Basically, as an employee, you will find you know, you will be spending time in four different states. You'll be doing work, you'll be communicating with people, you're waiting for information, and you'll be doing rework. So the more you are aware of the rework, the more successful you will be. It's okay to wait for information, it's okay to communicate, spend time on communication, but rework is a real waste of time. So again, you know, the project management part where I said, you know, you'll take three times the time of whatever you think you are going to take. Now, figuring out how to control that is going to be a big part of you know your control in the reverse. And we're going to talk about, uh, more about it when we talk about project uh, structure. And uh, you know, this one will become clearer. Not hungry yet? Oh, the smell is kind of yeah. <laughs> wafting over this way. <laughs> yeah, whatever you think is a logical break. Sure. Okay, I mean, we can continue talking in the last few minutes. Whenever you want to take a break. You want to take a break? Sure. Okay. About that time. In different ways, anyway. I just quickly will go through it. We know we are going to talk about Python and R. We know we are going to talk about databases, structured and unstructured, relational and not non SQL. Are any of these terms unfamiliar to anybody? Yeah? Um, yeah, relational and NoSQL. Yeah. 
and, and so relational is the concept is you know creating tables, structured tables. And no SQL is any unstructured data. For example, a text file. That has, for example, you know data that you get from Facebook. This is a lot of uh, strings that are uh, you know uh, conversation. That becomes uh, because it's not uh, arranged as a structured database like a uh, relational database. So it's called non 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 not I see. And there are other set of tools that are available for working with that. Oh, just saying, I'm glad you asked that because I thought I knew no SQL, but ends up I was wrong. Data, what were you thinking? No SQL. I just thought it was another flavor of SQL. Okay, okay. So data handling, cleansing, visualization, we already talked about all this, right? Machine learning, you know, this is the part where you think you. You are becoming a good data scientist by learning all this. Yeah. Out of algorithm, <laughs> right? You could be talking about regression. Does everybody ask what is regression? Relationship between huh? variables. Right, right. This line fits all of us. He minimizes our errors. Right. Wait, it is right. So most of machine learning right now is supervised, right? And so mostly modeling. There is unsupervised too. Like clustering. Good clustering. Good clustering. Yeah. testing. We're doing time series analysis, right? We're doing Monte Carlo simulation. What is Monte Carlo? Monte Carlo is, suppose you have to find the area of a circle. So either you can come up with a formula for finding the area of a circle, or what you can do is you know the area of a square, right? Mm -hmm. Now you draw a circle inside it, right? You're not the best of the circles, but let's assume that that's the circle, right? And now you start bombarding this whole thing with with points. And you just try to find out whether a point is inside the circle or outside the circle. You don't need to know anything about the area of the circle to do that, right? Okay. At the end, you count the number of dots inside the circle and number of dots outside the circle, and you can figure out the area. Oh, cool. Right? You don't need to know the formula. You just do an experiment and figure out the area of the circle. Cool. Right? So that approach is called multi Awesome. Thank you. There'll be a lot of words that you'll be introduced to. Words, words, right? <laughs> and this will be a never ending process. No. Given the fact that I've already promised you 100 books, <laughs> you can be sure that you'll have a lot of words to come by. But, you know, and while I say that, I don't want to scare you because what is really scary is this part the Dunning Kruger effect. The Dunning Kruger effect says that when you start learning something, you will come to a point very quickly where you're confident. We are at the peak of Mount Stupid. <laughs> right? When you think you know everything, your confidence is very high, but actually you're you're in the know nothing mode. Right? And then when you start you know start actually implementing what what you've learned, you suddenly realize that your your confidence is unjustified. Right? So you will come to the value of despair. Right? <laughs> And then you'll have the slope of enlightenment where you'll begin, like for example, John, right? <coughs> John was just saying that most programs focus on the hard skills, they don't focus on the soft skills. Mm -hmm. right? So this is my value of enlightenment, my slope of enlightenment, that you know the, the soft skills are much more important than the hard skills. You know? But you can always hire people to do the hard skills. The soft skills are harder to come back. So, so then, so basically, the reason I'm showing you this plot is this is something you're going to go through at a psychological level in the next 30. <laughs> you know, you're going to reach that confidence point at the top of Mount Stupid, and then you're going to really start thinking about how to implement that in a project, and then you're going to feel, you know, I really don't understand things. And that's okay. You know, it's another stage in the learning process. 
that usually you have a problem space. And your problem space could be a two-dimensional space where there's a variable x and a variable y. And you're trying to find out how a variable z, which is a function of x and y, how at what point does this value z has a max have a maximum value? Hmm. Am I making sense? Yes. Oh, I've done this. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know what this is. <laughs> yeah. so there might be a point here, which might be the right point at which Z has the maximum value, but X and Y. But in a business, you might find that certain values are not per permissible. Because there are only few values that uh, uh, that X and Y can take because there are some constraints on the business. Right. For example, a business has some regulations that they have to take care of or there's only certain you know, kinds of people that they can hire, or only certain kinds of products that they want to sell. Because of this, there are some constraints. For example, the constraint might say that you can't do business in this area. Right? So now you have to find a maximum value of Z only in this area. Mm -hmm. So that concept of you know finding a maximum in a constraint space is known as constraint program. Right, yeah. But that the simplex method? Yeah. It basically modi modifies our mean, uh, mean max, sorry, for maximization in a modified area. So the basic concept is to, you know, to solve a problem like this, you have to define something called your objective function. What is it that you are trying to maximize? Right? And in our case, that was Z. Right? And then you have to have some constraints. The constraint could be that x can be x has to be less than x zero, and y has to be greater than y zero. Right. So now this problem, this whole problem, is actually a very complex problem, and there are tools available to solve this problem. And we will talk about this later as I talk about this, and we'll talk about this a little bit. But you know, you won't be covering much of it in this class. So it will be up to you to pick up these, these concepts on your own. You know, mostly these concepts become relevant for things like supply chain planning. You know? Just kind of a advanced linear algebra kind of stuff. Advanced linear, yeah. So there's a teacher programming, linear programming, all these concepts yep. related to constant programming. Yeah. Then we won't be covering any natural language processing. You know, so look forward to covering that yourself. 
or if I come towards the end, I'll try to cover some of the natural light. So let's talk about data science life cycle. We talked a little bit about project management. Right? So one of the things that you have to realize about project management is why is project management of data science complicated? What happens in data science is you start by defining the problem. You talked about that. Then we collect the data and you prepare the data. And then we do some exploratory data analysis to understand the nature of the data. And then you start building your hypotheses. And you start modeling, and then you start evaluating your models, and then you want to present some results. And you know, in a general project, this could be a linear process. But the thing that makes data science complicated is that this is an iterative process. You know, whatever results you get, basically, will be predetermined. You know, the next the next cycle of data science that you will follow. So it's a never-ending process if you let it go its own course. So the way to handle that is basically to uh, to uh, set some targets for yourself that you will meet, right? So the way to control a data science project is by the indicating very clearly as to how many iterations are you willing to follow, what are the targets that you want to achieve in these iterations, you know, what are the constraints that you're putting on your your project. So these these are the things that make a data science project very different from a software project. Is time the biggest constraint usually? As far as the employer is concerned, yes. <laughs> because then most of the data science projects, the employer wants to see results very quickly. Right. right. And it's usually their expectations are very unrealistic. So the first thing you can do is you know lower their, their expectations and make them um, a little more realistic. Are they okay with that? If they are not, then they'll suffer the consequences. At least you did your job, you conveyed the message. Whether they got the message or not, they will understand it. <laughs> okay. And this is the reason why I say that data science projects will take three times the time, whatever time you allocate to them. No matter how lenient how you are trying to be, they'll end up taking three times the time. Because you will continue to want to improve your results. Before you present them, and that will end up taking more time than you, know, you are willing to take. That's all I have in terms of this aspect. Now we can switch to the business, understanding the business. Let me ask you one last time. Any questions until now? Okay, then I'll ask you a question. Which part of this first aspect made really, really good sense to you? This is the part you learned that you thought you did not know before you started. Okay. I like breaking people into quadrants. Okay. And then uh, especially like seeing not only that, but like the engineer analyzes, like so you should expect him to be asking you a question, or like the project manager, you'll expect them to give you a task if you talk to them. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. Okay. I'd like to second that. That was uh, I, I find that the the psychology and the philosophy is the part that I'm like really interested in, like delving deeper into okay. and learning more about that. And I kind of saw that as kind of like a a foreshadowing of that, and just like. I know, like, like you said, anybody can learn the technical skills if they have the aptitude for it. The, the soft skills are, for me, something that I'm really interested in digging deep into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, what were you thinking, John? It's not about data, but it's about people. Okay. All right, what about you, Um, I think it was more people. Okay. How about you? Um, my big eye opener was the fact that this is uh, this, there's a lot more, a lot more, more of uh, interacting with people um, aspect, aspect of it. Okay. I, I've been wondering, uh, just you know, why can't this be auto, auto, automated? Automated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now you're like, like, because like a lot of this is like, like algorithms and coding. It's like, yeah. well, I feel like I could do a pretty good job of coding something that would get most of it done. Right. But, yeah. It's a little eye opener to see how much of it is uh, doing people. Very, very, very good, very good. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, to me the 
customer's requirements based on your knowledge and your experience. Okay. Yeah, and of course, also the technologies like R, like Python, use algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, to help you to uh, predict the future and help the customer. Right. Right. Okay, let me make something very clear. No company is interested in helping customers. They're actually interested in making money. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. The customers are a roadblock that they have to cross in the process. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the reason I mentioned that is, you know, most companies are into behavior modification. Let's repeat that again. In the sense that they want to modify the behavior of their customers to buy their services. For example, now, when Amazon goes into business, right, what Amazon does is that it figures out what are the services it can provide. Then it calculates what percentage of the customer share will it get from those services. And then it decides to target only the, that set of customers that will make it profitable. Right? So it's not really that they are out to help people, they are out to make money. Right? <laughs> so you just keep that in mind.
And, um, can you go over the ad hoc reports and like how frequently? Can you just go over that again? I didn't quite grasp that the first time. So the thing is that what is what, so when you see a transaction, the transaction is what happens. Mm -hmm. right? How often did a particular type of transaction happen? That is what is ad hoc. Somebody will suddenly say, okay, I want to figure out, you know, how many times are we having customers come to us and talk in, uh, talk in uh, Hindi. Okay. Right? So, so that is what creates uh, the need for ad hoc reports. Okay. Somebody will suddenly have this question that, you know, I want to figure this out. Then come to and say, generate an ad hoc report. Okay. okay. So it won't be a regular report, it will be something done off the, off the cuff. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, in terms of understanding the business, I'm basically going to talk about my own experiences because I think that, that is the only thing I can really contribute. You know, otherwise everything else you can pick up in the book. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'll just talk about my personal experiences. So I will talk about how I started off in Oracle Detail. I also worked in Adobe as a senior analyst in India, and then worked in JP Morgan Chase. I talked a little bit about that. Then I worked in a company called a Startup called Tandy Data Services. And I'll talk about that. Then I worked for another Indian uh, consultancy company, which was called NIIT. Uh, it was based out of Atlanta. That was before I joined Infosys, which is my country called. So, article detail. So, here uh, my title was Principal Retail Scientist. This was in 2005. At that time, there was no concept of a data scientist. In fact, there were six of us retail scientists sitting in article detail, and we used to sit and wonder who will hire us if we leave this company. <laughs> <laughs> we were so clueless about you know where things were going. So what is retail? Retail is basically merchandising, right? You know, you have a store, you have a whole bunch of widgets inside the store, you're trying to sell this widgets, you're trying to make a good look find a good location for the store, you're trying to keep the store well occupied, well uh, equipped. And you're trying to make sure that you know customers there's a good uh, inflow of customers into the store. So there's a lot of things you're trying to do. Basically, what you're trying to do is you know be the end point of the supply chain. But finally, the product that is being manufactured at the manufacturer's uh, factory finally gets shipped to the client, to the end customer, and gets bought by the end customer. The more products you can sell, the more the better business you're doing. Okay. So the kind of decisions of, uh, you know, let's talk about apparel industry because that is one of the more complicated uh, businesses and much, much more challenging businesses than anything else in the in the retail world. So what we complicated is that in the beginning of the season, you have to think about how much should you buy. So when a, when a retailer goes and sells something, they first have to actually purchase that thing before they can sell it. So they are actually purchasing something from the manufacturer and stocking up their, uh, their warehouses before they are selling it to the customer. So they have to, in the beginning of the season, decide how much they want to uh, buy from the uh, corresponding manufacturer. That's the first decision they have to make. The second decision they have to make is where should I put it? Right? For example, somebody like Freeman Marcus or uh, Bloomingdale's will have 100 like, stores. So they, now, what will happen is that they will have a package and this package would have different assorted set of items. Most likely it won't be the same item. And it would have, uh, you know, different sizes and shapes inside that package. So now their question becomes, where do I ship this package? Right? And I'll talk a little more about that later. So uh, if you didn't follow this concept completely, don't worry about it. The third thing that will happen is, well, how, how, should I, uh, how should I price the item? Right. What, what should be the right price when I sell this item? Because now I have uploaded the inventory into my store, and now uh, you know I had an intro of date, and after that I want to clear my inventory. And my goal is that uh, you know at the end of the season I should have sold everything. So that's the pricing part, because that becomes another knob in the exercise. How do I price the item so that I manage to sell it uh, completely? Okay. And uh, so that is a really tricky part, and I will talk about why it's tricky. And then the last part is how do I promote it? So promotion comes into play like, okay, you know, I'm uh, there are two products that I'm not selling. 
I will try to do a, a markdown and they are still not selling. Right? Now, how do I get rid of my inventory? Because if it's sitting in the stores, then it's basically occupying space. Right? And if I want to clear my inventory, it's much better that I sell it to somebody than to keep it uh, or to distribute it to some charity or something. The salvage value of these products is minimal. Right? Like a dress that you think you is costing fifteen dollars, actually to the store is is probably costing not more than fifty cents, given all the manufacturing costs and everything. So the salvage value is also, you know, the value that they get if they try to dump it into the market is going to be very minimal. Yeah. So there is no no value in you know trying to recover the salvage value. So it's, it's even better that you give these items for free if they can if they can sell some other items, right? So that's where the promotions come into play, where you say, okay, you know, if I bundle this item with some other item, at least that item will sell. So, so even that turns out to be a useful concept to follow. So this is this is what a typical uh, retail business. These are the problems that the typical retail business has. So what Oracle Retail had done was it had we did four different products. The first product was called price. Uh, first product was called plan. The focus of plan was what do you buy in the beginning of the season? How do you figure out what you're buying? The second product was called place, which was basically allocation. How do you allocate this inventory that you have purchased across different stores? Okay. The third problem was the problem of pricing. That is, how do, you, how do you figure out the price at the beginning of the season? How do you mark down the prices towards the end of the season? And then uh, the final problem was the promote problem. Like, how do you figure out what is the bundle? Uh, how do you go about this one? And uh, you know, there are different set of algorithms that apply to all these two problems. So how, when you were working at, uh, uh, is this Oracle? Yeah. Um, did you learn about promotion in school anywhere? Or like, so to me, that was the one that was most surprising. Right. I was like, oh, promote. And then you like, you mentioned bundling, and I was just like, that was a field for me. I was like, well, that, that means smart. Okay. But like, that was not intuitive to me okay. to think in those lines. So, how does a person, um, like lifting weights? You know, you, there's you you have to train your body to get better at it. So, how does a person train their mind to get better at Thinking in these terms. Right. So, so let me give you an example. How many of you know about e cigarettes? Right. So at some point, I got into the business of selling e cigarettes. I was importing e cigarettes from China and trying to sell them on eBay. Right. Because that was a fashion. It wasn't like I thought it was a lucrative business. So I just wanted to understand the business. What is it selling e cigarettes? So I tried to do it the first week, and I did not sell anything. But my prices were comparable to everybody's prices. So the price of an e-cigarette at that time was five dollars. So I tried to reduce the price to four dollars. I still did not have anything. I reduced the price down to five cents. Right. Of course, you know suddenly I had a whole bunch of people asking me for e-cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was over over a month. I had a big list of customers that had bought each of from me for, for five cents a piece. But now they wanted to contact me directly. And now that they liked the product, they were willing to pay a higher price. Right? So this is the, the part of being a data scientist and being an experimenter. You have to be willing to you know, shake up the system sure. and make it give you the information that you need. Okay. The information I really needed was the customer list. Right. right? And that was worth the price that I paid for those e-cigarettes that I sold off. I have some questions. Because, uh, but not the order of your decision. Right. From the plan to replace, you went to price and promote. Yes. Is it possible to switch and promote just like where you are from the mm -hmm. Post price. Show you some signs. It is going to say promotion to determine the price. So actually, that's true about all these four things. They can each happen before the other thing happens. Right? So that's a very interesting question to ask because as a business, it is not to your advantage that you let these things overlap. Right? 
The reason Oracle retail could succeed was to break it down into four different products and sell them as four different products. If it tried to do all of these four things in one product, it would fail. So the real value in data science is in breaking down the problem into smaller problems and then being, being, being able to productize each of these sub problems. Because the advantage is they can now go to a customer and say, you want to buy a price, you want to buy a place, you want to buy a promote, you want to buy a plan. And they might get customers that will buy a price and not want any of the other things. Because they'll say, they doing pretty well with the, all the other three products. The reality is everything is overlapping with everything. But now you have put a foot in the door of the customer. And then you can probably sell them other things and, you know, uh, figure out how to, uh, you know, Overlap these products once they are inside the door. But if you present this as a single product, it will be very hard to sell. You know any sense? Okay. So I quickly want to talk about why retail is not easy. And it's kind of related to what you talked about, right? I mean, there's so many aspects to it, and there's so many ways to solve every aspect of it that you can think about different ways of doing things. But actually this slide should be saying why data science is not easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because data science itself means that you will have to, like I said, you'll have to break down every problem into smaller problems. Right? So the first thing you'll always find yourself doing as a data scientist is generating a forecast. You know? And the second thing will be optimizing your decisions based on that forecast. Right? Again, you can say the same thing. You know? The forecast is influencing the optimizer, and the optimizer is influencing the forecast. So shouldn't, shouldn't that be a single problem? But it's very hard to think of that as a single problem. And it's very hard to even convince your boss that this should be thought of as a single problem. You know, but he will be able to think of it as a forecasting problem and as an optimization problem. You know? So that's why I mentioned that when he comes to you and says, you know, what is going to be a forecast? You, may, you have to make sure that you help, you make, understand, you have a good understanding of what, what is he trying to optimize. Because the forecast is going to feed into that optimizer. And the success of your decision is going to depend upon how well that optimizer is doing. Now how, not how well the forecaster is. Okay? So if somebody starts judging you based on your forecaster, you will, you will fail like anything. No? Especially if it's a first time customer, and you have to, for example, you know, uh, at one point, Audi came to us, well, I was in NIT, Audi came to us and said, you know, can you generate a forecast for us, how many cars you sell? And I told the team to refuse. Because I am saying, if they can't forecast how many cars they are going to sell, how will Audi going to do a forecast, right? Because they are going to give us the same data that they are sitting at. And they have, they have data subjects too. So they are basically setting us up for failure. So you have to be always open to that option that you can always refuse a project. Because in a lot of cases, what will happen is that the reason somebody is coming to you with a project is because they have already tried 10 different things. So you will think, I will come in, I will do some great job. But you will find that you know they have already tried all the options that you are suggesting. So you have to make sure that you have a good understanding of where they have, what the history of the project is before you take up a project. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So again, like I said, when you talk about merchandise optimization, which is mostly retailing can be referred to as merchandise optimization, the common theme across the different tools that you want to implement is the predictor. The predictor will feed into the different aspects of you know decisions that you want to make. You want to be optimizing a portfolio, that is, you know, what is the range of products that I'm carrying in my stores? You could be wanting to optimize the uh, the amount of product that I buy at the beginning of the season, you can be trying to optimize allocation. Right? Allocation is how much inventory I'm placing in every store. And then there, there could be different price optimization modules also. That you can you know, there could be promotion pricing, there's, there's a markup pricing, and then there's regular pricing. So there's many different prices that one has to think about when setting a, a, even a one item price. So now we come to the question of what is 
what is modeling? What is demand modeling? You know, we already discussed that, you know, you'll have to come up with a forecast and it's going to be a tough process. So it's tough in two ways. Firstly, you know, your accuracy is going to be very challenging and second is developing a methodology for developing a forecast is not going to be easy. So mostly what companies do is that they look at their historic, historical data. They take their historical data and they try to figure out whether from the historical data I can predict how, many, how much sales I can have this year. When I look at the last four years, which is the most standard approach is to look at last four years of data to figure out how much I'm going to sell in this year. So what you do is you basically say, okay, like I've shown in this graph, basically you try to find any peaks in your data that you are certainly seeing a large amount of sales during Thanksgiving and during Christmas and during uh, Martin Luther King Day or you know any holiday or President's Day or uh, you know so you identify those peaks and you treat those peaks differently and then you try to find the trajectory of whatever remains after you remove those peaks and then based on that you say okay now I have a good forecast for what's going to happen during each of these uh, holidays and then I'm going to reconstruct everything and rebuild the forecast that I that I uh, anticipate for this year. So this is the general strategy for building a forecast. Am I making sense? Any questions on this? But is it just that Ancha is giving uh, the same pattern holds for next year? No, no, numbers change, right? You're going to look at four year numbers. Plus your understanding of the events might be different. Right? So, so now, last year you might have three stores that are open in a particular area and you're trying to forecast the Sales based on those three stores. Got this year you might have opened a fourth store, and now you have to take that into account for that particular thing. Okay. Well, not only the store, but the demographic change and other demographic factors. change. Demographic change. Okay, got it. A lot of things change. So again, you know, the, the general model would be that there will be a whole bunch of factors that will come into play. Like we already that you already mentioned demographics, right? So similarly, there could be many different uh, factors that can come into play. A company tries to figure out what is the seasonality of the product, right? And it might try to figure out the seasonality of a new product that they introduce into the market. So when they introduce a new product into the market, they can use a concept called light item. They will look at other items that are similar to this item, and from that they try to figure out, you know, how many of whether I can uh, build a demand model of this item based on other items that is similar to. Am I making sense? You're basically doing the same uh, one demand behavior applies to like items. Right. right. So again, you know, all these are knobs. The, all the inputs are basically knobs that can influence the demand. And uh, you know, your model would be, uh, you know, uh, a combination of all these parameters. And you'll have to figure out how much, how, how these parameters influence your forecast to build a good forecasting model. So, what is the, what are the key challenges that you will end up facing when you, when you suppose you have to make a, a time series prediction, right? Because this is basically a time series that you are constructing. Is that firstly your sales cycle might be short. You might not have enough data points to even you know, be able to say that, uh, you know, I, I can uh, make a prediction what will happen in this particular season. Because you might just, you might have one data point for every quarter. And you might have, like, say, two quarters. Now you just have two data points to work with. <laughs> yeah? So all kinds of things will happen that you will have to handle. As a data scientist, how do you extract data from, from less amount of data? Right? Extract information from less amount of data. And I'll talk about this in detail when I talk about uh, my experience at JP Morgan. This is of multiple demand drivers. So like we already said, there, there are so many demand drivers. And, you know, there's this concept of multicollinearity. That these demand drivers might have, you know, have competing influences as well as collaborating influences upon each other. Because of which, you know, it might be very hard to figure out from the data which parameter is actually influencing the output. That makes it further, it makes it uh, even more challenging. And of course, there's always bad data. You know, bad data is the easiest excuse for a data scientist. <laughs> Whenever results are wrong, you say, oh, the data is bad. So 
But the customer is not, uh, your, your boss is not going to believe that. No? Your goal is to extract as much data, information out of the data as possible. So if the data is bad, then you have, your model has to compensate for that. Then low rate of sale. <laughs> so the problem of low rate of sale is, for example, you know, if you are just selling, uh, say you are, you are a John Deere and you are selling trucks, right? And you are selling like uh, five trucks in, uh, in every store in every city. So if somebody says, you know, come up with a predictor based on, you know, your average sales of five, you might say, okay, you know, it could be seven, it could be three, it could be two, I don't know. Right? Because the number itself is so low, it becomes so hard to predict. Right? The, the reason sales are happening at a given store uh, is because somebody walks in and buys a truck. Now, how many people in that neighborhood know me a truck? Changes from uh, you know location and uh, season and place, you know all the time. So taking that into account itself makes the problem of prediction uh, challenging. Right? Why does it become challenging? Can anybody guess? So because um, when the data points are very small, that means the distribution of fat tail. Fat tail, right? Did everybody understand what he's talking about? You repeat it. Yeah, basically what happens is that with, with, with the data points, so if you look at like a uh, T table and standard D table and you look at the shift of distribution, T table, so the sample size grows, right? T table eventually converts into a D table. And the reason is, um, <laughs> if I explain this way, unless you have decision, you'll get it. But here's the easy way. Like suppose, right, you have 100 people in your sample and uh, you look at the weight distribution. So we know that the average weight of people in the United States is 170 pounds per male. Now, if you go to South Atlanta, right, where all the uh, people are like low income, poor educated country, though, right, even though they go from school, it's going to be way north of um, 170 pounds. If you go to the city like this year, we developed it, it's going to be south of 170 pounds. Now, if the sample size is small, right, you have a higher chance of grabbing samples which doesn't represent the norm. Going to be far different from norm, right? Yeah. So that means um, small sample means you have, uh, so a cost of small sample bias, that the end of the distribution curve has to be bigger because you're more likely to encounter extreme value. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It should be a long time to like, think like that, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so let me try to explain it a little bit more. Can I, can I put it to it? I'm just going to avoid it, but I think it has to do with it. Population within, within the lens of uh, data you collected. Now, if you have, for instance, you want to make a prediction or a forecast, and you're using 10 people in the whole United States yeah. <laughs> to determine the price of a food, of course, the information you go be biased because 10 people, it could be 10 people from the same family, which right. still are biased, you know, still are biased information. So, to get the right prediction, the right forecast, you need to consider a wide range of data. From different, you can start to take ten from from thirty two or ten states to be able to make up what you the result you want to get. I think that should. I mean, that's good to understand by that. I don't even right. So let me put it uh, in a different way. So generally, we all know that the mean square error is linearly proportional to the number of uh, number of. Uh, Variable that I'm taking into account. Right? It's linearly proportional, right? So what that means is that the root mean square error is proportional to the, the, the square root of the number of items. Right? Am I making sense? Right? So what that means is if the number of items is large, then the root mean square error is going to be. Uh, as a ratio of, of the mean is going to be small, right? But if the number of items is small, then the root mean square error as a ratio of the number of items is going to be large. So when you have a smaller number of items, basically your root mean square error will start becoming significant. And that's why it makes prediction hard. Yep. This is inversely proportional. Inversely proportional. It's inversely proportional to the square root of the number n. How do you explain it? Uh, if you take repeated sampling, it corrects just some um, why, why. How do you explain it in that part? So the number of samples, as the number of samples is increasing, n is increasing, right? No, no, repeated sampling. Because shouldn't the error be corrected if you have a repeat?
repeated sample where the sample size is small. Yeah. So you take a lot. So, so, in, so there's two, I think there's two ways to solve the problem. One is make the sample size be bigger. The other way is to uh, in, you have small samples. So you increase the number of times you take small samples. It won't give you the, the result you want because it's that's, only that's by us, I guess. Yeah, that's the problem. You're repeating the same data you have. Okay. So so let us take this offline. Yeah. Let's take this offline. <laughs> What are the challenges in optimization? We talk about challenges in forecasting. Let us now talk about challenges in optimization. Right? So the challenges in optimization occur because it's essentially a game between a merchant and a buyer. Right? Merchant is saying, you know, I'm going to use all this data science, I'm going to figure out my customer, I'm going to you know, make sure that the customer buys and I sell as much as possible. And customer is sitting there strategically thinking, how do I get a low price? Right? The so customer is saying, I will wait until the product is selling for cheap and I'll buy it then. Okay. So basically, it's come with a game between the buyer and the seller. Right? And so that makes, basically, it becomes like a game theory. So you have to start thinking about game theory and, you know, concepts from game theory. And that, you know, game theory requires that you have an understanding of your customer to that level. This is hardly true. So that's why this problem of optimization becomes a challenge. And that's where the concept of intelligence comes in, right? Now you have you have an intelligent uh, uh, rival, and you are trying to figure out your rival through the data. That's where an artificial intelligence comes. So bias can be discovered and or opportunistic. So bias themselves come in different shapes and forms, right? A bias can say, "I'll wait for the cheapest price." Or a buyer can say, I will, not, I will not buy at a high price. And although these two strategies sound very similar, but actually they are very different. Right? Wait, I have a question. Mm -hmm. so the introduction of market change in intelligence means that the market efficiency is going to increase? Market efficiency is going to increase. So, what is market efficiency? Right? I mean, market efficiency means that, uh, for example, the stock market. Right. Let's cover the stock market. There, you know, as the the prices to the actual, uh, know, actual price of the, the actual uh, item price, the more it's supposed to be there. Right. Yes. So depending upon how you define efficiency, you might uh, have to rethink about what you mean. So, oh, I see. So it depends on who has the AI and who has the control. Uh, so it could go either way. It could go either way. Okay, watch out. So the only way efficiency can increase is if everybody has the same level of uh, AI available. If the customer also has good AI, you also have good AI, then you are really competing. Right? So, but if you are Amazon, yes. and you can influence parameters in a way that your customers can't. Yes, because they control the data. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Our understanding of Psychology of pricing is, all, is still evolving. You know, for example, we all have heard the story that the item was priced less and was hardly selling, and then we increase the price and now it's selling uh, like gamble. You know, so sometimes even increasing the price can have a positive effect on on the number of items you sell. So how people respond to prices is also very complicated. So it's all dependent upon the value of the item, the the value that people want to convey, what what. Sticker price they want to tell to their friends that they bought the item for. So a lot of different things come into play in terms of you know why uh, you know how how pricing influences behavior. The risk and worst case scenario analysis for every strategy needs to be considered. Right? So this is what will happen. That right? no matter how many how good a data scientist you are. There will be always be assumption that you have missed out. You know, there will be some assumption that you will not make that will influence your business. Uh, could influence your business in a negative fashion when you actually implement your strategy. Right? So a different way of seeing this is basically the simpler your strategy, the more the more likely it is that it is a robust strategy. The more complicated it is, the more number of variables it uses, the more number of you know uh, optimization you perform on it. The more likely it is that you will um, be making, you know, catastrophic decisions. Mm -hmm. For example, for a long time, lean inventory was, a, was considered a very good factor. So the idea was 
to reduce your inventory as much as possible. Right? So that you know, the less inventory you keep, the less risk you take. But the problem with lean inventory is that there is a chance that you might run out of inventory. And if you start running out of inventory, then you will start losing customers. And then you will start losing customer confidence in you. Next year they won't even approach you for those for those kind of products. So you might just follow your relationship with your customers by keeping a lean inventory. So all those factors have to take, be taken into consideration. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay, merchants want to avoid uh, premature markdown and customers try on end of season markdown. Right? So again, it's the same point again that you know the merchant and the customer are playing a game on, on the opposite side. You know, they're playing basically a game of chess, but they're on the opposite side. And they're trying to beat each other. And that's what makes the whole process of optimization complex. Because to optimize the problem, you need to say, okay, I have a good understanding of the model to reflect the behavior of the other person, and now I'm going to model it, and then I'm going to optimize my model. But if the person on the other end is also changing the behavior, then there's no way that you can uh, optimize anything because everything is changing over time. So now, so finally, again, what I'm trying to convince to this slide is basically that you have to always keep your eye on the bottom line. You know? When you build your uh, your uh, mathematical models and you try to optimize the business, finally you have to realize that all a business wants to do is increase their, their uh, the dollar value that they are earning. Is that simple or is that difficult? Makes sense, right? But the thing is, you go in and you can change their, their concept of what the dollar value is. You can bring in the concept of customer lifetime, lifetime value. So you say, okay, the customer did not buy this season, but because we managed to hold on to the customer, the total amount that we sell to this customer over his lifetime is much more. So all these concepts have some psychology associated with them. Math is basically nothing else but, you know, psychology well defined. You know, with, 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 a, with some numbers around you know, psychology. Business, business itself is nothing but capturing the psychology in a proper way. So what parameters you're trying to optimize can change based on how you define your business. For example, here I have given another example, right? Suppose a, uh, a company, uh, I think in this case it was Neiman Marcus. Oh, this is okay, so ProfitLogic. So ProfitLogic introduced a new tool into the market. And that new tool was basically going to reduce the revenue of ProfitLogic. Right? But it was going to increase the number of customers. By increasing the number of customers, they suddenly showed that they would have a larger presence in the market, so their stock spiked. Okay. So even the money that they are making in the stock market itself is also something that they could count towards their revenue. Right. So there's different ways of thinking about profit and thinking about revenue. And all these things have to be taken into account before you say a particular decision was right or wrong. Making sense? Right. Okay, so the, what I want to convey from this slide is that basically, you know, making a prediction based on the historical sales data, you know, it, it, you have to be able to think of it as a, as a bottom-up problem. You have to be able to think of each parameter and how that parameter is influencing, and then how do you uh, how you are building a collective model out of all these parameters. So you have to build a very good understanding of how each parameter influences by itself and then understand how the parameter influences as a combination of other parameters and then basically build a model as a combined model. Right. Again, I'm going to repeat that point. 
The point is that as far as possible, decouple optimization algorithms from demand models. So we already talked about this that you know forecasting and optimization are two uh, two aspects of the problem, and you know you have to decouple them as soon as, as much as possible so that you can solve them as two separate problems rather than a single problem. Okay. Flexibility is more important than optimality. So what that means is that if you are making a decision, for example, by keeping a larger inventory, not following a lean lean inventory model. You are adding the, you are increasing the flexibility of your system because you have much more inventory to uh, available to address the needs of your customer. So now you are much more flexible to your customer's needs, and that is, you know, so a lot of times, you know, if you build a suboptimal model, but this can take care of a lot of uh, exceptional situations, then your customer will might prefer that to building an optimal optimal uh, uh, business model. Because finally, the goal is not just to sell a lot in the season, but to stay in business. Right? So you don't want to go out of business by trying to optimize them. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the allocation problem. So the allocation problem. So what is the allocation problem? The allocation problem is that you have a warehouse and you have collected a whole bunch of boxes in this warehouse and you are now going to transport all these boxes to the different stores. Right? Now these boxes, so what is happening? You know, you are sending these boxes to, you are sending two boxes here, you know, four boxes of different sizes here, then two boxes here that are both of different sizes. Right. So what you need to understand is that the customer base is different in all the three locations. Right? The types of customers that exist in the three locations are different. So that has to be taken into account uh, while you're building your allocation model. Right? How much inventory do you send to different stores is uh, dependent on your trying to maximize your profit. So when you are sending a package to a store, you're basically trying to make sure that that store should be able to sell out that package as much as possible, right? So, so this basically becomes a constraint programming problem, mm -hmm. right? Am I making sense to everybody? If anybody does not understand what I'm saying, please uh, object. <laughs> basically, boxes after the, the number of the box that each store has after the constraint to the sale, right? That is one aspect. The other aspect is that a particular box has certain items in it. Right? It's not empty, but for the subject, so it's a merchandise piece, so the box right. is actually right. different. Right. So I'm saying that in a particular box, you might have yellow shirts and black pants. Okay. Right? And it could be yellow shirts that are uh, women's shirts, and black pants would be, you know, uh, men's pants. Right? So these boxes are created by the manufacturer based on their, their own uh, constraints and their own, uh, you know, what, what they can package and what. Right? Because different things are getting produced at different times. Would it, be, would, it the book, uh, would it become like a forecast from based on the uh, locale as a driving factor? So the forecasting problem is for the manufacturer. When it comes to the retailer, it's an optimization problem. Okay, so retailer. Okay. A retailer has to figure out where should I send this box so that it sells as much as possible. For example, if the box has, say, black pants and yellow shirts, and there's only one store that is selling black pants, right? Yes. No other store sells black pants. Then they have no other option but to send their bags to the box to the store, and those yellow shirts will not get sold. Right? So they have to take that class. So that's the constraint that we work with. Gotcha. Right? Mm -hmm. So now this problem, like I talked about, you can solve it as a constraint programming problem. So you can define an objective function, and you can define a whole bunch of, of constraints. Yep. And usually that is solved as a linear programming problem. And so there are tools available to do that. There's a tool called Cplex, and then there's a tool uh, called uh, FIFO. They both solve uh, linear programming problems. Especially, I think they're good at solving integer programming problems. So you can apply one of these tools, and you can make them solve the problem. The only challenge is that is these problems are very computationally intensive. <laughs> right? You can each of these problems could take a week to get solved. 
you know, no matter how much firepower you have, you might find yourself using a lot of firepower to solve these problems. So what Oracle teacher had done was it was solving a totally different redefine the problem. What it has said was let me consider that as an auction problem. Right? So what they are saying is every package is going to get auctioned off to these stores. And depending upon how much inventory a store is carrying, they're going to make it a bid for this package. And whichever store comes up with the biggest bid, best bid, will get this package. So now the problem is not a function of the number of constraints. It's a function of the number of packages. Right? So is, is that their heuristic approach to solving the problem? Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah, does that take into account that different customers might be coming to different stores? Yeah. That's how they're coming up with the demand function. Oh, right, and because the, the inventory function, depends on the customer. The demand function determines the bid right. that each store is placing on there. Yeah, the store's not going to bid on something they can't sell. Right. I mean, all this is hypothetical. It's not like a store is actually bidding on anything, but it's like they have created this as a different problem to solve the same problem, right? Mm -hmm. So now the question becomes how, so they've used the heuristic. They've said, okay, the heuristic is we can make these stores bid on these packages and we will send the package to the biggest bidder. Right? Does that just become like kind of a greedy algorithm? Yeah, pretty much, right? But now the question becomes, I can solve this problem using constraint programming or I can solve it using auction algorithm. Okay. Which one is better? Well, depending on how long you have to let the computer run. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, if I needed to find the optimal solution, it would be the uh, linear programming method. Right. Because that method is not going to be wrong. It will just take a lot of time to solve right. the problem. Right? But then I have this heuristic approach that gives me a, a solution, but I don't know how good that solution is. Right? Right. So, the, so now the, that becomes your comparison point. So your ceiling, your glass ceiling is basically the solution that the, that the uh, linear programming method is given. Right? And your, your option algorithm is going to give you a solution that is suboptimal. But it, if, it, if it can approach, the optimal uh, values, if you if I was making a million dollars to the optimization algorithm or the linear programming algorithm, and the auction algorithm makes me nine hundred and ninety thousand dollars. I would say, okay, you know, what am I losing? I'm losing ten thousand dollars, it's not a big deal. Right. Right? So it just becomes a question of how close the heuristic the algorithm based on heuristic comes to the the actual uh, you know the, the optimal solution, right? Right. So as a good data scientist, that will be your second job. The second job would be to find heuristics to solve these problems. The more you can reduce the load on your on your computational requirements, the, the better data scientist you will turn out. Right? Because this is not analysis, this is modeling. Right? So th this is modeling and this is finding a solution. Right? And this is about reducing the complexity of the solution. Right? So that's why this also falls into the world of data science. Am I making sense? Any questions, Elliot? No. Okay. <laughs> so we talked about the possible solutions. You can have a constraint programming. You can formulate it as a constraint programming problem. Or you can come up with an auction based solution. Right? And then you know you can keep adding more heuristics to make the auction based approach come closer to the uh, constraint programming uh, solution. For example, one of the heuristics that I had uh, added to, the, to this method was something called the minimum shipment requirement. So I said that, you know, I understand that stores are bidding for items, but a particular store might say that, okay. I need to have a certain number of items to even sell anything. Because mm -hmm. they have to display the item. So they need a certain amount just to be able to display the item to the customer. So that becomes the constraint where you say, first I'm going to make sure that every store gets the minimum shipment required. Then I will start the bidding, the bidding uh, on these costs. So you can add these heuristics and your solution will get closer and closer to the optimum. That's cool. But how do, you, how do you know how close, uh, what's the error between the optimal versus the auction error between the heuristic based approach? How, how, do, you, how do you know it's the uh, simulation? It's like Monte Carlo simulation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now let's talk about 
about Adobe. Here, basically, what Adobe was doing was it had uh, Adobe uh, is known for its thin trap software. It sells these software packages that come to your home as a string track box, and you know you can install it using the CD or the DVD onto your computer. So it's very heavy duty software that uh, Adobe sells. So Adobe wanted to get out of that, at least you know, investigate other models of doing business. They wanted to get into that service. So they acquired a company called Acro, and they renamed it as Acrobat.com. And uh, Acrobat.com was, for example, providing four different web services. The first web service was uh, ex Extract PDF. So the idea was, you know, you'll upload all your uh, PDF files and it will convert them into Word documents and then you'll extract data. If they're Word documents or Excel documents, and then that way you'll be able to extract all the data. Right? Then the other was create PDF. So you'll upload certain documents and you'll convert them to PDF and you'll send it. Then it had a product. Uh, it had two more products uh, along the similar line. I think one was focused on uh, email. That if you're sending large attachments, send now. So it's called send now. So the idea was, you know, if you send a big attachment, you just send a link, and uh, I, the item itself gets stored on a server on the end. Right? So they have all these web services, and they wanted to see how well they can do in the world of web services. Right? So that's interesting because now they are talking about a model that's totally different from this, the shrink that software model. It starts becoming like an Amazon model. Right? A customer goes to Amazon website, and depending upon the features of the Amazon website, those features start influencing the amount of products that Amazon is going to sell. Right? The performance of the Amazon website is determined by what is displayed on the website. Right? So Adobe was finding itself in a similar situation where if it built web services, then you know what is being shown on the website starts influencing how well they how well they are being able to say. Right? So as a data scientist, my role was to firstly be able to track, or as a data engineer rather, was to be able to track the activity of a customer when he comes to a website, and then from that basically make an inference about whether their behavior uh, can be influenced by changing certain, certain uh, messages that are being sent to them. Either as an email or as pop-up. Right? So the customer logs in and he's playing with the website and he gets a pop-up message and he uses that pop-up message to figure out what he's going to do next. And now you have influence this behavior. Or you send him an email later on saying, you know, it was thank you for visiting the website, you know, we saw what you did, we noticed that you had some problems, we can fix them, something like that. Okay. Huh? The pop -ups on your right. Your So these are the possible options for modifying the customer behavior. So just to describe what the project turned out to be like, basically the first thing they asked me to do was to map their website into a street diagram. Like when a customer comes in, what is the first thing he does? Well, so he enters his credentials. That becomes the first task. After he enters his credentials, he visits the web page, and then he has to upload all his documents. That becomes another task or another state that he needs. Right? And you can figure out for all, all these states as to where the failures are happening, where is the system crashing. Right? So, so that's something you find yourself doing if you get involved in web services. You know, if you have a client like say you know Target or say uh, Walmart, you know all these customers that have web presence will want to understand you know what is the navigation uh, behavior of the customer and how is that getting. Navigation behavior getting influenced by the quality of service that customers require. Now, making sense? Okay. What's the compound state? The red one? Yeah. So, the compound state is good. It's now upper right, it's being red. No, I understand. No, no, that is just uh, showing that what are compound and what are the uh, simple states. So, basically, you progress the, uh, the state becomes more complex, right? So the reason it becomes complex is that the server is also performing such an action. Okay. There are a lot of states where only the customer is performing an action, uh, but the server is providing performing an action. A compound state is where both the server and the and the, and the uh, visitor are both involved in such an action. That's what makes it. 
Would authentication not be a server thing too? No, but uh, authentication is something where the customer is entering his credentials, uh -huh. and then the server is going to perform and then it's coming back. Right. And it's Identify those cells that are uh, that have high numbers in them. Right? So 
So basically, what a company is trying to do is just trying to take all these transactions and then split these transactions across these different cubes. Okay? And then identify which of these cubes is the most important. So for example, here I've shown. Couldn't you use like lasso regression to help you figure out um, which of your variables is important? So the advantage of this approach is for visualization. Oh, okay. Right? It's just a visualization, it's a visualization of matrices. That's yes, what it right. is. Right. Oh, okay. Right? So the surface is not analysis as much as visualization. Gotcha. Because now you can take this hypercube and slice it and dice it in different ways. And you know, you can display it and you know, to the marketing team, to the sales team, to the Product development team. Um, so different teams can then start looking at this hypercube. Gotcha. So if your hypercube is serving only one team, then it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> okay. So basically, what will happen is your hypercube, say it has eight cubes. These eight cubes will split into eight different segments. So you're basically now taking your customer and splitting him into eight different segments. Suppose you are keeping account of number of customers following in every queue. Now, from the user segments, you can build a behavior model. You know, what is the transition? What is the, so you have done a count on each of these queues and found out how many elements, how many customers are following in each of these queues. But what about the transition from one queue to another? Right? A customer that is buying, you know, two items today might suddenly start buying five items per month tomorrow. So now he's transitioned from one queue to another queue. That hypercube space, right? Right. So figuring out how people are transitioning across this hypercube is very important for companies because it gives them an idea of where the what is the trajectory of their customer. Right? Would family size maybe exactly. be an example? Yeah, a lot of things can happen, right? The house, the size of their house could increase. They could buy a bigger house. Right. right? So now suddenly they're following a different buy. Um, I guess I don't understand how the cube visualizes things, or what does the cube tell you when you're looking at just that? So what happens? Or how is would it be presented? You can build a dashboard on top of this. Cube. Right? Just like so, labeling each corner. Uh, for example, Tableau. So the data. So for example, what I did with uh, Adobe was build a Hadoop cube for them, and then build a Tableau interface on top. So the idea of Tableau interface is now you say, okay, I just want to look at these two dimensions. I want to look at the data only. There might be 12 different dimensions there, but I just want to look at these two dimensions. Okay. And that helps me visualize the data. From the queue, Right. 
larger the dollar amount of what people are fighting for. So, for example, you know, I have worked on this project for six months and uh, they hired a whole team from CCA, Tata Consultancy Company, different number consultancy company like this. And uh, the team was hired, we worked on this project for six months and they hired their own team, <laughs> you know, their own internal team, and they got rid of Tata Consultancy. And after a uh, few months, they fired the company. <laughs> so nobody could understand what exactly they were trying to achieve. <laughs> a lot of times, the internal politics is, you know, one person trying to control something, and if he gets the control, that's fine. If he doesn't, he just drops it. Just like government. Huh? Just like government. Just like government. Right? <laughs> So what was the question here? The question here was, our customer was Whole Foods. We had uh, store data for 200 Whole Foods. This was before uh, Whole Foods become a part of Amazon. Okay. Right? This was 2013, okay. 2013, 2014. So Whole Foods was still not part of Amazon. But uh, so uh, JP Morgan had this credit card data. So every credit card transaction corresponds to a merchant. So now they have all this data on the different merchants. Right? So what they can do is if they can somehow use this data to predict what is going to happen to the stock of Whole Foods, then they can take that information and make uh, bets on this stock. So in the stock market, there's this concept of earning surprise. So the concept of earning surprise is that the day before the earnings is announced, nobody actually knows what the earnings is going to be. So anybody who has any idea of whether the earnings are going to be positive or negative, I mean, whether the earnings growth is going to be positive or negative, can benefit significantly. Oh, yeah. Because then they can place a bet on the market and then they can make a lot of money in a single day. So in that context, basically, uh, what JP Morgan wanted to do was figure out whether there's enough information in the credit card data to predict the revenue of a customer. So if I can, so let me put it differently. So uh, say a company announces its earnings on February of 2019. Okay. That earnings will be based on the sales that they had from uh, October to December. The quarterly sales that they had in the quarter of October to December. Okay. So they are not going to announce I mean, they're not going to tell anybody what their sales are until until the uh, earnings call date. Right? But if uh, a company like JP like JP Morgan is sitting on all their transaction data from October to December, then they can actually look at that data and say, okay, we know whether the earnings are going up or down. The only problem is they don't have all the transaction data. They only have 20 percent of the US market. So at the most they are looking at 20% of the data, but 20% is still significant, right? If you see a trend within the 20% of the data, then you already know that there is some trend developing. So that's what they actually wanted to do. They wanted to look at the data and be able to predict the direction of the uh, earnings, whether the earnings are increasing or decreasing. Right? This case, they trying to make a uh, make abnormal profit by betting on uh, on let me see, co, co and put option on the Price change on the initial stock offering. It could not even be called in put. You just buy the stock, right? But the magnify is put uh, with derivatives, much more magnified. You get higher leverage. Right, right. But you get more risk off. Anyway, our discussion point is not uh, the buying strategy. Our discussion point is how they are coming up with the prediction of the rate. Can't you do uh, data mining and look at past data and see? It's a model you construct, it's predictable or not. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Right? I'm saying they are looking at the transaction data from October to December. Right? Let me just write it down. Maybe then it will be complete. So let's say this is the whole year. Right? This is the first, this is the uh, 
first quarter, quarter goes from January 2019 to March 2019. And the second quarter goes to, let's say, June 2019. Making sense? Yes. Right? Now, the company announces their, their earnings for this quarter at this date, in the middle of the second quarter. So they are announcing their earnings on the first quarter at the middle of the second quarter. Right? Yeah. So a company like Jason Morgan can say that we have all their transaction data in this window. Because we have all the transaction data, we can predict you know, what their earnings is going to be. Right? The only problem is they have only 20% of the data. Right? So now, they have, but what they can do is, they can say, we have 20% of the data from this side, we have 20% of the data from last quarter. We have 20% of the data from quarter before. So we have to, we know that you know that we have 20% of data for the last uh, n number of quarters, right? So now we can convert it to a linear regression problem. That if we see in our database that the total sales for the last quarter was one billion, and the quarter before that was half billion, and uh, and uh, Whole Foods came out said their earnings was. 20 billion last quarter and you know 10 billion the quarter before. Then we know that you know our numbers are one one uh, five percent of whatever numbers uh, Whole Foods is coming up with, right? So automatically, if our numbers now say two billion, we will multiply it by 20 and we'll get 40 billion. So we can use that to predict what their what their earnings numbers are going to be like, right? So it could be as simple as that. Could right. be. Right? But could could be, right? But the reality is it is not. You have, you, have, you have to know, you have to sift through the data to find out what percentage of that 20% was actually uh, purchased from Whole Foods. That's what you have to do. No, no, so all this data is from Whole Foods. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I'm saying that, that J2 volume can easily look at the data and say which of these transactions are Whole Foods transactions. That's not ours. Okay. Right? In fact, that's what I was doing. I put a, a transaction description on each of these things, right? Okay. And for each of these things, I identified who the merchant is. Okay. Right? Remember me talking about that? Yes, yes, yes. Right? But I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think um, what the rest of the purchase, how, how what the correlation would be. Let's forget about the rest of the purchase. Let's right. just focus on whole foods. Right? Okay. Right? I understand your point as to what you're saying. You're saying, you know, what is the value in of information in the total number of sales versus the sales in Whole Foods, right? Actually, what I meant was, um, you, you don't have all the data on Whole Foods. You only have a fraction of data, right. Right? Right. which is less than 20%. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. so if the fraction, so how do you know how how much of that? Oh, you you know because they have to publish what the gross sales is right, right. before they right. 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 yeah, so you know actually know that. Yeah, so you know the total sales they've been coming out with. Yeah. And you can you know, scale it up accordingly. Yeah. Right? So this comes like a standard investment analysis problem. Right, right. So it, it could be as simple as that, right? But it is not. When you actually do that analysis, you come up with a large error. Because there are so many other factors that are coming to play. Right? The number of customers is changing at every location. Yes. Right? And you know, customers are switching from one store to another store. You don't know what the dynamics are at a individual store level. Campaigns too. Huh? Campaigns. Depends on. Yeah, campaigns also, right? So a lot of things are happening. So the point is like, how do you handle that now? Right? Now suddenly you have this problem that you thought you could easily look at this 20% data and figure out a prediction. But your numbers are coming out to be much worse than you expected. Right? So the idea was, yeah, we talked about this. So now this is the question: Can can JP Morgan estimate the revenue of Whole Foods? So initially, the JP Morgan model is based on looking at the total sales in a quarter and then just uh, doing a linear regression on that, and that didn't work out. Right? So what I suggested was. Let us do a stay store by store because we know there are 200 stores. Let us do a store by store uh, analysis. Let us figure out what is 
is a if you use each each store as a predictor. Oh, okay. How well is that store doing? Right. Because what you have done when you are using the combined shells of the whole store is that your formula is. Yeah, okay. So what your formula becomes at that point is your your predictor is the sum of the sales of all the stores. Right? But instead of that, if I switch the formula around where I say let me build a predictor on every store and then take a sum of the predictors. So you're you're making a more high resolution model instead of coming at the total, mm -hmm. you're breaking it down to each exactly. so it's a higher grain resolution. Exactly. exactly. Right? So it's a different way of doing the same same uh, math, right? Sure. But the advantage is that when you start doing that, you can now, uh, because you have 300 stores, if you notice that your error on every store is, say, 12%, I'm pretty sure, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have 300 stores, your, your error will drop down to 0.7%. Can you say that again? So suppose your error on each store is 12%. Right? Because you have 300 stores, what does 300 become? 300 root 300, square root of 300 would be uh, like uh, 15. Right? Yeah. 15. So basically that that 12% will now become 0.7%. Because of the thing that we talked about earlier, the root mean square error. Right? right. So now by taking the predictor, making a predictor in every store, you can reduce your prediction error from 12% to 0.7%. So it is these tricks that basically get you closer and closer to your prediction. And smart it can make a big difference in your final oh, yeah. answer. So again, you know, when you do that, you have to figure out what are the assumptions you are making. You know, what were the assumptions you were making before, and what are the assumptions you are making after, and how does the new model not, uh, you know, how does the new model compensate for these assumptions? Uh, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm just going to skip this for a moment. Okay. So the basic thing is again that you notice. So if I try to make a prediction on a store level, I notice that you know I, when I try to make a prediction at a quarter by quarter, I do start seeing the Gaussian curve. You know, a bell curve is popping up. So that bell curve tells me that I'm on the right path. If it was a multiple, if it was a, it had double peaks in it. You know, or, or it had multiple peaks in it, then I would question, you know, how I'm doing this and you know, what what should I do it now. But the fact that clearly the you know quarter by quarter this turns out to be a bell curve gives me confidence that you know something is doing right. So basically what I'm trying to say is that you can extract a lot of information even from noise. If you know how to characterize the noise. If you if you have a model for the noise, even noise can carry information. Am I making sense? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because someone you know, catching accounting fraud. Yeah, looking at pattern you noise know, is one of the major ways. Right. Yeah. Right. So what he's talking about is how you know fraud is caught by finding uh, that uh, something is non gaussian If you see non gaussian patterns in your noise, then you start noticing that there's something going on. So again, at the end of every project, you know, you, you would have this exercise and say, what did we achieve? So what we achieved in this case is we figured out that you can think about the store level sales for estimating total sales. And more specifically, we have a model that actually resembles normally distributed variance in store, store by store sales. I showed you those uh, sales, right? Then we managed to use the richness or noise in the sales, sales, sales data to build a better mathematical model. Again, not trivial. Then we use so the other thing was when you are looking at uh, when you are looking at uh, sales data, right? And you are trying to make a prediction using sales data. You have to also make sure that you don't use too big a time window, right? because if you use a large time window, then things the underlying dynamics of the the variable that you are trying to track is themselves might be changing. Yeah, seasonality. Yeah, not just seasonality. You know the Store location, you know, how much promotion we can do at a store, that would change from store to store. So a lot of okay. different things can come into play. So if, so you can't use too big a time window to figure out, you know. So when we say okay, we had we just use four four uh, uh, four 
orders worth of data, mm-hmm. which basically means we use four data points for every store to figure out the transaction. So for every store, we are saying these are the four data points that where we recorded the sales in the four last four quarters, mm-hmm. and all we do for this quarter is uh, do a, draw a straight line through these points and figure out what the sales is going to be in that store for this quarter. And then we take the average of that across the 300 stores and come up with the total sales across the 300 stores. Cool. So four quarters is not as bad as you know 15 quarters. Okay. So, so then okay, the final point is of course you have to convince your customer that you know they can make money out of follow analysis. <laughs> Did they make money? Yeah. Huh? Did they make then, money? Then they fired me. <laughs> <laughs> But then again, that was internal politics, right? I mean, they wanted to build. Their but then they fired their team after. Yeah, they fired their team after. So. <laughs> yeah. But once you've done your job, you're supposed to move on anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the point is, you know, I'm ready to do business on my own. The next, the next project I took was with a startup, and that startup basically had the same kind of data, and we tried to sell that to hedge funds. Um, how is this with hedge funds with a lot of data science is working for them? Pardon? I would think hedge funds with a lot of data science is working yeah, for them. Yeah, of course, of course. Of course. Now, if you get a job with a hedge fund, you are set. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a call after. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Again, so now this is a project where I talk about transaction strength. Right? So, again, since I've already talked about this, I'm not going to. But the basic idea here was that I figured out that if you take a string, a description string has substrings in it because you know the spaces are separating the different words mm-hmm. in the string. So I broke the string down based on the substring or based on the words, and then figured out the frequency of those words, and then tried to figure out which words carry information, and then use that to basically I go back and forth until I come to a point where I understand exactly you know, what each substring corresponds. Okay, so my next project was with a company called Tangent Data Services. Again, I'll keep data science. So what these guys were doing was, they were partnering with a third party called Return Pass. What Return Pass was doing was they had access to the email boxes of a million customers. Okay. So the email boxes were set up such that suppose I make a purchase at Amazon. Right. Amazon will send a receipt to my email box. But now that I have access to your email box, I can look at all the receipts that you have made. Right. So what Tangent Data Services was doing was looking at all your transactions. Through your email boxes. And then using that to predict, you know, again, what a company like Amazon is doing or what a company like Target is doing, and trying to predict their retail sales using that. Okay. And then did you like send promotions to them once Ooh. you once you correctly predicted? Well then you sell that data to hedge funds. Oh, okay. okay. Then you go to hedge funds and say, you know, earning surprise, we know exactly what this company is going to come out with. Now, all you need to figure out is whether the earnings is going to be up or down. You, know, you don't need to find out the exact uh, number. You just need an up or down page. Is a million a large enough sample size in that case? That's a good question. <laughs> so, I mean, so depending upon the uh, penetratability of the, that million customers into different retailers, not every retailer was being used by all the million customers. Right? So, that was the real challenge. If all the, if any, if there was a retailer that all the million customers were using, then it was not a problem. Because the million customers is still, you know, at least five percent of the US population. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. A little bit longer. Huh? A little bit less. Much less. It's like point five percent. Well, it's like three hundred million. Two hundred. Let's say two hundred million households. Yeah. Then it's point five percent. But even then, you know, you can uh, make some decisions. You know, election campaigns, they make judgment based on 30 people. Yeah. Right? So, oh, that's the minimum size for a tea table. Yeah. Table, yeah. 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 So they, they say that if you have a good collection, good uh, sample size, sample size, then you can make a prediction just by using 30 data points. 
Pharmaceutical is even worse. It's like 10, 15. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Voluntarily. 
me. You got me, you you got me like Ken. You know me. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> but the end result is the same. Huh? End result is the same.
that's how you know information things that you learn at one point in one sphere can easily apply to other spheres when when it comes to the my mark because my expertise was in markdown writing i gave them a markdown and a markup writing model people like me at of course set up for professional analytics they are approach analytics okay so this is a slide i want to talk about so this was a message i tried to propagate within nit but you know did not succeed and uh, partly did not succeed because i think it was more complex than the customers were willing to handle but the idea was that when i proposed layered analytics then as you are aggregating data you can make different business decisions at every layer So, for example, this middle layer is a typical analytics stack, right in the middle, right. And as you aggregate data, you can go from data capture to data transformation to segmentation to descriptive modeling to statistical analysis to forecasting to predictive modeling to optimization. Right? Now, your model, your uh, prediction can, uh, your uh, business decision can fail because of errors at any given level. And so now, so there is room for doing data quality analytics at each of these levels. Okay. And this basically displays the power of uh, of a layered analytics approach that you can actually perform data quality analytics at each of these levels and figure out where the system is failing at each of these levels. And then based on that, you can uh, improve your your uh, predictive power. Again, I mean, the only reason I'm showing you the slide is this is how complex and uh, you know interesting these projects can get if you if the company lets you uh, proceed around these. That's all I have. Any completion? Yes. <laughs> I have a related question, but maybe of course, of course, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay. Is there a lot of data science stuff regarding the current thing? Why do you ask me to see cryptocurrency? I'm interested in cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a lot of investment houses are getting cryptocurrency. Okay. And uh, it seems like it's perfect for applying data science. Right. It depends on what aspect you're talking about. Okay. For example, you know, Coinbase gives you a, yeah. a API. Yeah. Right. Which you can uh, perform oh, yeah. automatically. Right. Right. You can take that, uh, that API and do a lot of things. You can use that to extract the company. Yeah. You can automate the tracing of sales, of trade. So that basically falls into the world of trading. Okay. Right? Now, yeah. if you come to mining, yes. that becomes another aspect. Okay. So there are many different aspects to cryptocurrency. 